Once again, another double dose of goodness. This week we have a four-time Bassmaster winner that just set the all-time biggest winning weight of smallmouth bass on the St. Lawrence River, 105 pounds even. He also owns the record for the biggest winning weight margin in Elite Series history. Of course, I'm talking about Patrick Walters. As if that was not enough, Jake's take is back in your life with Bassmaster camera guy Jake Latondres. He breaks down everything that happened at Champlain and, of course, the St. Lawrence River, where he just happened to spend four days with our eventual Bassmaster Angler of the Year, Stone Cold Kyle Welcher. And all that happens this week on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. That's right. I am back in your life. Welcome one. Welcome all friends, family, freeloaders, fish and freaks. You're all welcome here at the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. And uh, it's good. Good to be back here. Been on the road for a few weeks. Um, if my voice sounds a little different, I am uh, battling a bit of an ear infection right now. So um, things sound a little different, but um, not an ear infection is not going to stop me from talking to you fine folks. And we have a double dose of goodness, as I said in the intro, both Patrick Walters and Jake Latondres on this week's show with Jake's Take. Um, two incredible events uh, we have. Finally decided all the Bassmaster Classic qualifiers and all the requalification points. All of the, the Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year belongs to Joey Cifuentes. Congratulations on that. And, of course, Stone Cold Kyle Welcher is your progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year. And uh, just so you know, in case you're wondering, going to be on the show next week. We never announce a guest that far in advance, but uh, Kyle... And we had talked backstage, and we're going to do a show together next week. He's going to get home and spend a little time with his family, and good for him. That's what you should do after you win a big event like that. So next week, we will break it all down with Kyle Welcher and uh, lots to talk about with him. Um, but we're going to hear a lot about it today, too, because Jake was with him for all four days of the final event. Also was with Brandon Cobb at the second last event on Lake Champlain. Spent a bunch of time with Cody Huff there. So a lot of things to talk about that have happened the last few weeks. Here's, here's something different and new. Um, I'll go back here. Look, look right here. I'll dig deep into. We have new things on the set here. And this was, uh, this is the Bass Chaser. That's right, the Bass Chaser. For those of you listening to the audio version, uh, what we have here is, I would say, a... 1980s or something, um, I believe a Bronco, all done up as the Bass Chaser. And it is a very um, nice gift that came my way, thankful to, let's put it right there, with all the precious things that I own. The Bass Chaser became part of my life because of my good friend Brian Bickle. I'd like to thank him for that. Him and Dan O'Toole in a bit of a bidding war for that at... Um, at the Orno um, thrift store or something. I don't know. I didn't know that Dan O'Toole. Speaking of which, Dan O'Toole, check out his podcast, Boomsies. I've been on it. He's a good dude, a good friend. But if Byron Bickle had a podcast, I'd say check his out first because he got me the Bass Chaser. So thank you for that. And thank you for everyone who does send the fine things that adorn the shelf behind me. Um, whether you've sent bobbleheads over time, whether you've sent the Bass Chaser, you guys have all made this set um, kind of neat, and I thank you for that. Um, two incredible tournaments we had this past week, obviously. Not this past week, but these last two weeks. Champlain, and then we went to Thousand Islands. There is so much to get into. This is going to be a long one, I can guarantee you, uh, just because they are. And uh, like I recommend, if this is too long for you, just break it up like a candy bar. Have a few pieces every once in a while. Um, or just have it all at once, if that's your pleasure. But I thank you all for watching this show week in, week out. But first of all, we're going to join a friend of the show and a guy that you guys are so used to seeing here on the show. And that is the one and only Jake 
Latondris, a Bassmaster videographer, our behind the scenes guy, and friend of the show with Jake's Tape. <laughs> Hi, Dave. <laughs> hey, Jake. Hey, Jake. Good morning. Oh, good, good, good morning. You're looking chipper. <laughs> I'm feeling chipper. I can uh, partially hear out of one ear. And dude. dude, the last two weeks seem like a, the last two events of the season seem like a lot freaking more than two weeks. Like Champlain feels like a month ago. No doubt. I mean, I logged like, let me see. Dude. I logged like almost 8,000 frequent flyer miles flying back and forth from Champlain to Colorado, back to New York, and then back. And, and like you said, these were back-to-back -back events, and it all came down in like a 10-day period. But I feel like it was – Champlain was like a month ago, man. Yeah. it. Um, well, I mean, it was basically a quarter of the season, too, when you look at how it impacts things. Like, I, I mean, it's crazy to work that, but it – like, just imagine what it feels like for the anglers. You know, oh, you had anglers goodness. that two weeks ago were safely or felt safely inside the classic. And then those two weeks happen. And two, you know, all of a sudden, you you know, they're so busy. And then, boom, you're out of the classic. The season's over. It's Un unbelievable, crazy. man. I, I want to say something and, and to... And, and I, I don't want to jump ahead, but I just want to say something about that whole classic qualifying and, and getting cut and getting cut from the field for next year. You know, I saw Daryl Gleason pulling away from the dock Ooh. on the last day. And I want to give a shout out to him because I really like Daryl a lot. And I know he worked his ass off, you know, to come to the elites, to stay in the elites. And when he was pulling away from the dock on the last day there, he just looked so down. His wife was in the boat with him. His, he was looking down at the ground and I yelled his name out and I, I gave him a thumbs up and he gave me a thumbs down. And then I gave him a heart, a brave heart pump. And I just, I, I got choked up, dude. I was like, you know, this is a brutal, this is a brutal reality at the end of the season, every single year for you know 5 10 15 or 20 however many the cut is there's it's a brutal reality for a lot of people and and it hurts it hurts me it hurts you it hurts them it hurts their families it hurts everybody because these dreams get crushed at the end of each season and i just want to give a shout out to those guys that have made it to the elites that got cut that aren't coming back and we love you man we love you once an elite always an elite yeah, it's a they they go back into requalifying, and it's always one of the toughest things, dude. Like, I mean, and and I mean, I say one of the weigh-ins, like the final week's weigh-ins, are always tough because while there's so many people making their first classic and doing it, there's people who have chased a lifelong dream, and um, I, I don't need to get into listing them, but that's tough. It's real. I mean, I think we talked about it one morning before takeoff when we were just walking down to the ramp one morning and i was like could you imagine like i don't think people stop to think about it the way it actually works like i mean dude could you imagine if they said to you 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 better you better be on every single hook set you better never miss a hook set while you're shooting today or if they said to me you better never mispronounce anybody's name never you know stumble over a word or you're done. You're no longer the MC. I mean, I'd be a mess. Um, and to see how tough it is for a lot of those anglers. I mean, it's a, it's a brutal thing. You know, it's the other side of the sports that nobody wants to talk about. It's, you know, everybody wants to talk about the top of the leaderboard and that is triumphant and amazing. But, but I will say this, there is some triumphant, amazing stories from anglers that have to requalify. I mean, you don't have to look any further than a guy. We recently did one of the most real shows that I think I've ever done was with Carl Jacobson a little while ago. Mm -hmm. That dude had to requalify, mm -hmm. you know, cut from the elite series, had to go back and actually went to FLW, had some success there, then requalified through the opens and he's back. And, you know, it's, just, it's so 
the chapter's sad, but I don't think the book is sad for a Daryl Gleason and for any others that fall in that group. And, you know, Daryl and his family are so strong. And it, I mean, it sucks right now what they're going through, but it's it's part of our game. And it's something I should remind everybody that's listening to us that they, these people have real feelings. So it's real easy to make a comment on social media and be like, you didn't catch him here. You didn't. It still sucks. So much love to all of them. And uh, Jake, thanks for starting this show up on a high, no high note. <laughs> wow, awesome. Well, hey, I was just going to go into the high note with, you know, the stories of Carl Jacobson and Maddie Wong, the guys that, you know, Carl yeah. was out, out of the classic and he worked his way back into the classic and is triumphantly joyful today. And then you've got Maddie Wong that thought he was going to get cut. And that kid went in and did what he had to do at Champlain and, and St. Lawrence river events and made it back into the elites for next year. Like there are, you know, there are triumphant stories within the stories as well. So, you yeah. know, I just felt bad for Daryl and I, I don't even know who's on that list, but you know, it sucks. And, and again, yeah. you know, it's part of reality and, and we have to move on. Right. Part of competition. Um, yep, exactly. Some humor from that, not, not a humorous situation at all, but um, I got to give a special shout out to, Emily Harley. Emily Harley does all of the media for Bass. Um, all the press releases you see, everything. But she does way more than that. And I actually told her that this week. It's amazing to watch her interaction with the angler's kids, her interaction, you know, it's simple little things. Like, I mean, she's backstage making sure she literally holds onto their raincoats during a rainy way and she'll hold on so they can get a raincoat as soon as they leave. Like things that are not part of her job. She makes Bass a better place because of that. Things, uh, so many different things that I see her do that aren't her job, but she made them her job and she makes Bass a better place because of that. But one day she did not make my job any easier. <laughs> and uh, uh -oh. I'm going to bust her on that. And it was Daryl Gleason. Dude, you know me. I, I mean, I, I love all of the anglers in the Elite sure. Series. Um. And I hate seeing them go through that. And you do get a personal relationship with all of them. So Daryl weighing in was, was tough. I mean, he knew it was his last way in um, for this shot at the elites. And um, it was just emotional. You know, he was welling up and, you know, we hugged and shared a few words and, but dude, I'm trying to hold it together on stage. Cause it, it is hard at times to hold it together in emotional times. And I look off the side of the stage, <laughs> me and Emily are both wearing glasses, but it is clear to <laughs> anybody within 150 feet that we are both bawling at that moment. So I'm trying to like get my act together. And then I look off stage and I see Emily bawling. And I'm like, uh, it didn't make it any easier for me to compose myself. So shout out to Emily and, um, on the great job she does. And she's so emotionally invested in our anglers that she made me more emotional. <laughs> she's like, the, she's like our surrogate mom at the weigh-ins. I mean, I came in on day four and sat down on a bench beside Cooper Gallant and Tyler Rivette and uh, who else? Someone else was sitting there and, oh, uh, Jay Shakira was sitting there and Emily walks over and I just had come off, you know, a, a, a big water ride 53 miles and she comes over and goes, Hey man, do you need some water, some crackers, a snack? Do you, wh what can we do for you? And I was just like, man, thank you. I just want to stand up and give her a big hug. She's that kind of person. Yeah, for sure. She's incredible. She's one of the, mm -hmm. even if she is Alabama bass fan. that, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> most of the people that work for bass are, <laughs> I mean, I it, guess that's true. <laughs> I guess, I mean, other than the TV guys, Arkansas, and the, woo yeah. pig. Yeah. Um, but you know, she is, she is truly one of the unsung heroes of, of our team. Um, you don't hear her name a lot. Um, but man, I'm going to tell you without her, whoever, you know, when she decides not to do that job, whoever is going to do that job is going to have their freaking work cut out Good for them because luck. Well, 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 what she used to make sure everybody was okay. Like, I mean, it is really amazing. Like, can you just see how, all the anglers kids run to her. It's just, she's a great person, but, um, 
she did make me cry one day a little more than I wanted to. Um, let's get to Champlain because uh, two events to hammer down on here. Champlain feels like it was six months ago, but it was literally only two weeks ago. Not even quite two weeks ago because it got extended. You know, obviously the winner was was on a Monday, but um, you got to fish. And this is a unique thing about this Jake's take because the biggest story going into these last two events that everybody was talking about is the progressive past master angler of the year title. And you got to spend time on the boat with one and two. And obviously um, at Champlain, you started off with Brandon Cobb, correct? Yep. I, he was in the lead at Champlain. So I started off with Brandon Cobb on day one. And um, I don't know how to say he didn't, he didn't do that well without saying he did really well because he doesn't normally do well on those Northern swings. Cause he's a big large mouth guy. Right. Yeah. And he did. Uh, I don't remember where he ended up after day one, but he didn't fall that he, he, he wasn't that far down the line. Um, he just wasn't in the top six, which is who I would cover on day yeah. two. So that's why I ended up not being in his boat. Um, but you know, when he went out, he went out to his first spot and he actually stayed in that area for most of the day on day one. Um, he caught a ton and I mean a ton of, of smallmouth, but they just weren't the right fish and he made some adjustments. And the one thing that I remember about Brandon Cobb at Lake Champlain was he made a decision when the wind kicked up, he made a decision to go back whatever direction it was to this spot he had in front of one of these big islands. And, and he really didn't have that much weight. He goes up there. And as I recall, um, it was a long time ago, but as I recall, he upgraded or maybe he only had four fish or he needed some pretty good upgrades, you know, to get back in this thing. And he went up there and did it on a whim in 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 pretty big water i mean and so you know brandon cop the thing that 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 you know we always talk about with angler of the year contenders or winners is how consistent they are and that consistency comes from making good decisions when things aren't going well you know all, paying attention to all those little details that matter that accumulate over an entire season. And that's one of those things that Brandon Cobb, Kyle Welcher, Brandon Polinick, those guys that, that, you know, that are up there in those standings. Um, that's, that's one of the things that they do. Well, they make decisions and you, sometimes you, as a camera guy, I go, huh, wonder how this is going to work out. This is going to be pretty rough out there. Is he going to be able to control his boat? He ends up drifting, with the current and the wind and landing on a spot that had some, some four pounders in it. And he upgraded and, and climbed himself back into, you know, where he thought he, he what he needed to do to stay in contention for AOI. I love he, Brandon Cobb. Oh, it's tough not to he, love him. A great yeah. dude. Um, great dude. And, 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 and that's honestly was the sentiment going into the, final two events like amongst most of the anglers it was like man two great warriors are going to go to battle we want to see who wins um this is awesome yeah did he feel different at all like that first morning did did it look like he was feeling the moment did it nope he he is he is he's he's a different kind of cucumber cool than kyle welcher is because like you always say kyle welcher's stone cold poker face right that's who that's who he doesn't get rattled Brandon Cobb has this positive, happy-go-lucky, I'm just going to go fishing and have fun kind of attitude. And that's what he carries into those high-pressure situations. And I've been with Cobb a lot. I was with him on Lake Fork when he won there. And, you know, I've been with him intermittently throughout the year since then. And he's always got this really positive attitude. And he's like, like he's one of those guys where you say, if, if, if we weren't involved in all this professionally, we'd be really good buddies or I'd really like to go fishing with him because he's just so fun to be around. He's a great guy. A great dude. Um, and, and I've said this a million times, he had an angler of the year season. 
You know what I mean? Both him no and Welch are like, I mean, it comes down to one day, one call, one. <laughs> that That's, I mean, it was an angler of the year season. But I, I feel, and nobody knows what they both were feeling. Truthfully, I mean, we only know what we can read from the outside. Right. But I felt like those final few events, I hate, I, I, this is not, those final few events, it felt like Cobb was leaving it to destiny in the way that he was like, hey, man, I'm going to fish my heart out. I'm going to do everything I can to win this. But if it's going to be mine, it's going to be mine. And I got a different vibe from Welcher. I got a vibe from Welcher that was like, I now he never win. said any of this. Never, ever said one of these words. Neither of them did. I'm just, this is, I could be so wrong. But I felt like Welcher was like, and and I kept bringing it up. But I I think there's something to be said for that close finish at the classic. You know what I mean? If you look at oh, there's no doubt, at, dude, no doubt. When you've been that close, when you've met, and it's not the walking off the stage. We always talk about it's the week after. It's the waking up three days after and realizing. I almost had that. It was so close Four to ounces being mine. Away. I was so close to being on every cover of every magazine of being that guy. Or just winning the classic. Just yeah. having that coveted trophy on your resume, like the accomplishment of that goal, like AOI is, you know, that's what's important. It's about it's and when you when you're a competitor at that level, you play to win. Kyle Welcher plays to win. I yeah. mean, I, I dude, where I know we're gonna get into this, but I, I get goosebumps on my arm thinking about Welcher because he Slow is down. a freak, down. Dude, we're not talking about him yet. We're I, gonna I know, get I know. I, I, he is dude, he is I, a competitor. That and, dude Dude, the first time I ever talked to him, I mean, like he's one of the few people that I've ever locked, walked away from and been like, dude, and this is like <laughs> his first season. I'm like, dude's going to be here forever. He's going to win. He's going just because the way he's and Cobb is the same. Cobb is going to win plenty. And and I'm plenty. not saying even that their personalities or the way that the vibe that I picked up off them made it any more or less likely the Cobb would have won it. I mean, there's also a side of it where if you just go in and you're free and it goes better for you. Um, so it's not exactly, exciting. exactly. But I think that that Welcher has tasted defeat. And I think that taste of defeat, like I feel like if Cobb is in this situation again, I don't even want to continue because all, all, again, those are all just my thoughts. You know what I mean? Sure. But I, I just really felt like there was a different aura of coming off both of them. And, and that was just what I felt. I think it's a, I think it's a built in human. Everyone has a different way of dealing with things, whether it's adversity or success or losses or whatever it is, everyone deals with things differently. And I think the differentiating factor there was that, you know, Cobb, it's, it's almost like a built in mechanism to not to not be completely shot if you don't win yeah. something okay it's that hey man i i'm just going to i'm just going to do my very best and let the chips fall where they may and we'll see what happens and whereas Kyle Welcher speaking of chips you know he's got that poker background and he's got that stone cold face and he's just like you know I'm going to if I get someone down nothing against any other angler cuz he's friends with all of them right yeah but he's that guy that if I have if I can step on someone's neck, I will and I'll keep my foot on there until it's over and then I'll shake hands with him. But he's he's a ruthless competitor, no doubt. No doubt. And and ruthless in a good way. You know what yeah, I mean? Like yeah. because uh, nowadays there's a lot of ruthless kids yeah. going around in the sport. He, not one of those. But, no, 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 not at all. Uh, dude, he I just think he, everything is percentages to him, just like just like playing poker. He knows how rare the opportunity that he was in is. And, and again, this is no shade whatsoever, but I, I just feel like. It was just two different personalities going into that. And, and dude, and Cobb will 
win plenty of tournaments. Cobb oh, will, yeah. you know, when their careers are both done, they're both going to have incredible careers. They will battle out for many years to come. They're very similar angling styles. Um, but Cobb spent a lot of those time that time in between those events saying, oh, yeah, no, I don't I don't even know what a smallmouth is like kind of downplaying it, which could have been genius. I mean, we could have been having a whole different conversation, which is the truth about all sports. Yeah. If you you know, the the result always paints the narrative. You know what I mean? Like if if Cobb wins, maybe we're having a conversation where like Cobb was just so relaxed and free exactly. and Welcher <laughs> was just driven on that. But but I do think that what Welcher did on the final three events really showed, like, if you looked at St. Clair and I believe Champlain, both of those events, after, at the halfway point of that tournament, after two days of competition, everybody thought it was Cobb. All Cobb. Like, Cobb is going to leave this event with a giant lead. And two events in a row, Cobb had a weak third day, and that's when Welcher struck and had a strong day and it tightened up. And then we got into what we had, the final event being six points separating them. I mean, one of the greatest angler of their year races, you know, we went into the final three separated by one point and then it was six points going into the final one. So it, it was an incredible angler of the year race, but so you fished with Cobb on day one, mm -hmm. had a decent day, but he fell out of the top six, mm -hmm. but he had, again, a great northern swing. I mean, you cannot. He was say he was he totally was happy. Yeah, I think yeah. he had. I think he had like nineteen and some change, or close, or maybe twenty pounds. He had a. He had one of those. Oh, I, that is right. He had like nineteen ten. He was pushing twenty pounds, but then and he he had it right. He's like, you know, I think I did. I did pretty well for myself and and what I my goals were, but. I think 19 is probably going to, you know, put me down around the middle of the pack. And holy crap, when we came in for the weigh-ins, he was exactly right. Because I think he ended up in like 30th and 30th something with almost 20 pounds. Yeah. Yeah, he actually, I'm looking that? right now. He finished yeah. 32nd. But his northern swing, again, he got him. I mean, he finished no 30, 31st at St. Clair, 32nd at Champlain. And 23rd at Thousand Islands. I mean, he had a great northern swing. Solid. And they both said, I just want this to be a fight to the end. And it definitely was a fight to the end. That group of anglers that came in at the same time, and I'm only going to name four or five, only because I don't have a list of anglers in front of me to go back and remind me <laughs> everybody that I want to mention. But the Patrick Walters, the Luke Palmer, the Brandon Cobb, the Kyle Welcher, that group of anglers that came into the elites at the same time, those guys are going to be around for a very long time. And those are the guys that are going to be the, you know, the, the future history makers in this sport because they're next level. They work hard. They can do it all. They're not, they can, they can, you know, look down at their front face and sonar. They can go. They can go flip. They can throw spinner baits. They can do whatever it takes. They can adjust the things that they need to, you know, to 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 satisfy, you know, whatever they need to do to to do well in these competitions. They're they're going to be around for a long time, and you can see them, you know, just getting better and better at every event. So speaking of people that are going to be around for a long time, the next three days of competition, you fish with a guy that, that people don't talk about a lot, but he's going to be around for a long, long time. And I think he's just, he's a quieter guy. You know what I mean? It, it, he, but you're going to be seeing this dude catch fish for a long time. And that is Cody Huff. And you spent the next three, three days with him, correct? I did. And he, opened my eyes to several things. I was with Cody when he almost won Pickwick last year and he was out there slinging that, uh, spoon around. And the thing that I noticed about Cody Huff is how calm he is. And I mean, he never gets rattled and, no. and never, like, it doesn't matter if, 
what happens if there's an issue with his boat, his electronics aren't working right or something's going on. He just doesn't get rattled. And I think, you know, that's a, obviously a key ingredient in doing well, because when you get rattled, you start to spin out. When you spin out, you just start making bad decisions. And then all of a sudden everything goes down the tank. So, you know, I want to definitely give Cody a big shout out for staying calm under all kinds of different situations. And one of the other things that he truly opened my eyes to, and I know this is going to open a big can of worms, but I'm ready for it. At the end of this tournament, me and you felt the exact opposite about it. And we yeah. didn't even talk about it. So I can't wait to hear what he opens your eyes to. So the front-facing sonar technology is obviously a huge topic of conversation on lots of different levels at every level high school college opens elites mlf whatever right everybody's talking about it and i've gone back and forth as to whether i think it's a good thing or a bad thing and it's hard to to pick sides or choose you know what's right or wrong about it for me because i see people i see people flailing under the guys that are good at it and i see the guys that are good at it succeeding triumphantly with front facing sonar and one of the things that that cody huff brought to light for me was the pelagic open water environment that they have unlocked on all these different lakes and I started to look at this going, see, this is, this is something they're catching fish that no one even knew was out there. They're catching fish that, yeah, they may be up on the bank spawning, but once they get out into that open environment, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm no elite professional angler and I'm still learning a lot of these things too, um, you know, behind what these guys are showing us on television or through my camera lens, but I feel like that pelagic bite is a, so different and it's such a, it's, it's not easy. People think it's like a video game and yeah, the screen is like a video game, but man, to go out there, especially in big water and to be able to follow those fish around and, and understand what they're doing when they can't exactly see the fish and they know what the bait fish are doing and they know there's a fish there and they throw baits out the little Demiki rigs or whatever it is they're throwing out there to catch these big fish, these big adult giant, you know, biggest fish of the, of the, of the, uh, of the environment is, is it blows my mind. It, it's, it's so, I just think it's amazing. And I know I'm on the, I'm on the front row and the, on the back deck watching this go down and it may be boring to watch on TV. I've actually never seen it on TV, I, but I can tell you this from the back deck, it's really exciting and it's fun to watch from my perspective. Go Dave. <laughs> I don't think I have to say anything. I mean, I can just let the comments talk. Yeah, right. Yo! <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Um, I love what we're learning. I love the educational element of forward-facing sonar. As an angler, it's incredibly fun to do. It, it really is. I mean, I've spent a good amount of time doing it now, and it is a lot of fun to identify a fish, watch your bait come down to the fish, see the fish. All of that is a lot of fun. It sucks to watch. And I know um, me even saying that is, is probably going to ruffle some feathers. But, I, I mean, dude, I'm just being honest. Like, when you watch it, it is... I mean, I started referring to our anglers as a pack of orcas. I mean, literally, they all just come together. Two tournaments in a row, those third last and second last tournament. I mean, literally, 90% of the people that were players in that tournament were in that area, that one area. And literally, and we saw anglers not just scoping in, on their trolling motor, but we saw multiple anglers just literally driving, looking for fish, and then they'd see some. So our... Anglers have become like a pack of orcas where they just separate them and 
And and that being said, dude, our anglers, in my opinion, are all professional anglers. They don't have a choice. Like they literally, they're the only one in this that the choice has been made for them. If you're not embracing it, you're getting left behind. Um, and I think that's what you're seeing in some of our, like you look at our angler of the year race this year. And I don't mean at the top. I mean, for the classic qualifiers, there's a lot of names that we're all used to seeing in the Bassmaster Classic and have been for a quite a time, quite a bit of time. And they're not in the Bassmaster Classic, but I honestly think what, and again, this is just what I see. Anglers opinions are all over the board and, and we're, you know, thank God for them because they're going to fuel this podcast for the next five to six months <laughs> until the season starts again. But, um, I just feel like the anglers don't have a choice. And what we saw in angler of the year this year was a situation where people got left behind. If they tried to straddle the fence, you saw people like Kyoya Fujita, who, I mean, five top tens out of nine. I mean, look out when this dude actually figures out what he's doing. I mean, that's his first season, five out of nine top tens, but all of them were with that. And I think what we saw this year was, if you tried to put one foot on the dock and the dock is traditional bass fishing and one foot on the boat and the boat is forward facing sonar, you end up doing the splits like we've all done at some point, or at least I did at one point, I learned that lesson that you can't put your foot on a moving object and a solid object. And <laughs> it's not good. The splits. But I, and I think that's what we saw. And, and to me, um, it's just going to be very interesting to see what the future is. Like, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know that it should be made illegal. I don't know that it shouldn't be made illegal. Um, is it a situation where it's illegal during prefish, but not legal during the tournament? All of these things. I do think it needs to be talked about though, because it's bigger and better than anything that's ever come. It's live. It's changing. It's changing every element that we all love i mean dude we had anglers catching fish they didn't even feel hit like you just think of how you know that's the angler that wins the angler that's got the most sensitive touch and the goblin on the screen overrides all as long as you're willing to follow it and just so i mean ultimately i just yell things when people catch fish how they catch those fish <laughs> is is up to them and it's up to the rules of the tour um, but I would say at this point, it's definitely at a point where it's going to get discussed. It has to. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I, and weirdly enough, I, I don't know about you, but I feel like up until the third last event of the season, it wasn't a discussion that was happening. You know, it was just a tool people were. And now it definitely feels like it's different. Um but that being said, there's no part of me that says there isn't a skill, a science, a precision. Uh, Cody Huff and people like that are so good at that. And and look, at Cody Huff was a thing before that was a thing. There's no part of me that doesn't think that, like, if that goes away, Cody Huff goes away. No. I, I mean, that, it, that you hear people talk about that, like, take that away and see who will catch him. No. They're still going to catch him for the most part. But there is some people that are, that's everything. And, um I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's an amazing tool. It's it's an amazing time, but <laughs> I, I I don't I don't I don't know what the what the future holds. Like it, you know, golf carts are awesome too. I mean, I love them. I use them every single time I play golf. I mean, how else do you carry your beer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the amount of balls that I need to play golf. I mean, it's an excessive yeah. amount. Um, but they're not allowed in the PGA. Um. I have an analogy. Okay. I knew you would. The analogy for me now as a bow hunter is are the advancement of trail cameras. Okay. Years ago, I've been, I've been in whitetail in the whitetail world television production for almost 25 years. When I first started, we, we hardly had trail cameras. They weren't, they weren't, 
they weren't as big a part of the game as it is now. And then as trail camera technology with night vision and timers that would actually capture an animal in a timely manner to set the camera off to capture the animal in the in the photo ha have come now to where they have cell service trail cameras and people i know people that have 30 40 or 50 of them all on one cell service uh that they have to pay for monthly just like a, a, a cell phone bill and they track deer with cell phone trail cameras which yeah. is live they send the picture right and to they your get phone it. they if get the it right deer there passes at 2 30 in the afternoon at 2 30 their phone lights up with that yeah 100 percent. and so the analogy that's a that's the closest analogy that i have and it's changed the game and people say well these guys wouldn't be here without for us front-facing sonar and maybe Maybe not. I, I don't know. I, I can't answer that question. I'm not qualified to say yes or no, but I do know that as much as front facing sonar has changed the game for fishing trail cameras, trail camera technology has changed the game for bow hunting whitetails and elk and uh, hell, all kinds of game the same exact way, because now they can track animals, understand where their home range is, know where they live, know what time they come out. And then all of a sudden they're on top of it. They go shoot a Boone and Crockett whitetail with their bow. And all of a sudden it's not the same thing as it was when Fred bear or miles Keller or Jay Gregory or whoever was doing it, you know, 40, 50, 20, even 25 years ago, it's not the same because there's so many advantages that you have now. So, and the, the difference is there's not, you know, bow hunting's not a competition and there's not a hundred thousand dollars on the line or careers at stake when that goes down. So there is a difference, but I just wanted to point out the analogy that I came up with in my own head on the airplane ride back from Syracuse, New York yesterday. <laughs> so. Here's the difference, though. Those trail cams that tell you that the deer went through your past your stand at 2.30 in the afternoon, whatever, that gives you like, okay, so tomorrow I'm going to try to be there at 2.30, and hopefully the deer does the exact same thing. This is even more than that, dude. This is almost like you sit in your stand, and you can... Like, now you can only see the deer that you can physically see with your eye, but this is a machine that shows you... Uh, I mean, it, it's... Again, and I don't think it is the resource killer that people make it sound to be. You know what I mean? Because we're already seeing as little as it's been used. And it is little. I know we as anglers think it's a lot. But if you look at the percentage of time that a fish has had the opportunity to feel it, and I don't care if it's the busiest lake in the world, it's still minuscule it shouldn't be affecting it yet, but it's already affecting it. We're already hearing from anglers that the, you know, you're having to cast further at the fish the fish are reacting the fish are moving away so i believe the resource protects itself i think the question becomes is it what people want to watch and ultimately i mean that is a very important question i mean every sport deals with it i mean in other sports when something makes it boring they generally adjust it now i've heard people talk about limiting it to one graph or and to me, that's, I mean, the graphs are just going to get bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's right. all. I mean, and, and again, I don't know what is right, but I do know that, that there's a lot of people in this world that think they got the answers for it on both sides of that argument. Um, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> no, and, and neither am I. I. I'm just, I just being honest with what I saw. I mean. Same. I hosted a segment and at one point I turned to Davey and I'm like, we didn't even talk about what was this is the first time we've ever done a segment and hardly talked about what was happening right in front of us. Because that's one of the coolest things about fast life. You ask me, I want to see how that dude moves his frog. I want to see all these different things. I want to, you know, all of those points, but then it just becomes about head down. That's chasing true. The fish. Catch them on true. tiny little baits because they're not feeding. <laughs> I mean, that's why they right. have to use tiny little baits. I mean, that's right. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's that's what I think. I mean, mm -hmm. um, and sure, there's some matching of what they're feeding on and stuff. I mean, it's just a it's a weird 
We're going to get yelled at for this segment. We are. But, <laughs> Let's but just clear. It doesn't matter who. Some, <laughs> someone's going to praise us and someone's going to yell at yeah. us for sure. Somebody really hates you right now and likes me more. And somebody I really know. hates me and likes you more now. Exactly. And wow. and again, I'm just, I'm just calling on observations that I've made and I'm a fan. I'm a fan first. I mean, I yeah. love to bass fish and I'm a fan first. I'm a fan of all these anglers, every single one of them. Like I have the utmost respect for all of them because of the grind, the, the economics, the logistics, the family domestic matters that come up, you know, during the grind and all these things, the longevity, the pressure, all that stuff. I'm a huge, huge fan of every single one of these anglers. You know, I do get to see, that's why Jake's take, I guess, is popular to some people because I get to observe from a different perspective than most people from the front row of these bass boats. And I found Lake Champlain and what Cody Huff was doing and, and several other anglers out there chasing those fish down in open water. I mean, they were catching fish four feet below the surface yeah. in 70 or 80, even 100 feet of water. I mean, and I was looking at this like, this is like sail fishing on the ocean, you know, on a much smaller scale. But it's kind of the same thing. And I don't know, man, I just learned so much and I'm going to say, I'll, I'll finish this part of the conversation with saying, I don't know what's right or wrong. I'm not qualified to answer that question. I do know that what they've learned and what I've learned watching these guys unlock these mysteries and prove old, like Rick Clun always says front face. He's an advocate for it. Yeah. In, yeah, in the sense totally that, is. and he looks at it like, just think about what we've learned and that's where I stand on it. Like the positive of front facing sonar is so cool because of all the things that we've learned from it. And I just think it's, I'm, I'm a huge animal lover. I love wildlife. I'm a hunter and a fisherman have been my whole life, but I'm not, you know, I'm not there for the kill. I'm there for learning and understanding what's going on in these ecosystems because it fascinates me when you learn something new about them. So yeah. that's my stance on it. Yeah. And, and you know, like you mentioned, Rick Klon, Rick Klon has a much more of, uh, I mean, this is just thoughts. You know what I mean? Like I would never argue with it. I mean, if Rick Klon says it's good for the sport, <laughs> Rick, exactly you nailed it uh um, he's been around the whole time man yeah and he's seen it all um i just i i'm not against it like i said i love using it it is a great piece of technology I, and i wonder to play devil's advocate can you put the genie back in the bottle like just think about okay, think about just champagne exactly. for example what you saw what that group of contenders saw let's say it becomes illegal we go back there next year can you can you not can you ignore what you found out there or or do they find a way to find that without that technique you know what i mean I, like it, I it, it thought becomes... that when we were out there i thought that exact thought on the boat with cody huff i don't remember what day it was but i remember thinking so if they took this away now they know these fish are out here how, what are they going to do? How are they, you know, does it become blind chasing, just broadcast? They know the fish are here and are they still going to be able to catch them? They're not going to be able to see them, but they're yeah. certainly going to be able to know that they're out there somehow. And somehow some little part of me tells me that someone would figure that out because those guys are so freaking smart and they understand how bass work and they understand the environment, the, the resources, the bait fish, the structure, all those things. I feel like someone would figure that out. And then that would be cause that would turn into a new trend. I mean, it's all about this. The advancement of the sport is all about trends, figuring, unlocking, unlocking the lake which is what we call it, that turning into a trend, other people following that trend that understand it, multiple guys getting really good at it, and then all of a sudden that becomes a, a, a systematic approach to how a group of people are going to fish th that lake, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
I, I don't know. I don't know what the future holds for it, to be honest. I, I, I mean, all that keeps ringing through my head is it's literally like, I mean, you're a great photographer. I mean, you take some incredible pictures. Could you imagine if somebody said, well, you're going back to film? You know what I mean? And you just got to hope and go to the I'd place and have it developed. <laughs> You know, you know what I mean? Like there's That's another analogy, Dave. I mean, yeah, no, all there's... the YouTube digital autonomous. I mean, I was building drones. I don't take this the wrong way. Cause I'm not bragging, but I'm telling you, I brought the drone to Bassmaster. Like they didn't even know drones existed until I brought, I had a meeting with Mike McKinnis and um, I, I forget who all was there, but I had a meeting in the conference room at JM in Little Rock and brought this thing we called a quadcopter to the table. And we showed them videos that we shot for express boats. And all of a sudden that was the day the drone came into the outdoor world. You put and all the helicopter pilots out of business. A hundred percent. Blame me. I know. I know those guys, they got lots of other jobs <laughs> and and so since then, even since I started, you know, we were shooting on film or we were shooting, you know, on metal tapes or beta cam discs or whatever it is. And we had to learn the hard way. We didn't have YouTube with tutorials on how to turn a camera on, you know, now new guys that have come into the sport and I'm not knocking them at all. The, the, you know, the, I'm not even going to say who they are, but those young guys that are really good at it, that are putting great content out there, didn't learn the hard way like we did. And they have resources and, and they're, they're in the game. They've taken, they've, they're, they've taken, taken over the content creative side of things because they have the tools to be able to go out and do it very quickly. And, you know, and, and here we are. So, you know, it, it's, I guess it's just technology and it's the advancement of it all. And there's nothing we can do about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. And, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's like, Hey, and there's, there's a part of me, maybe there's a world of people that are going to fall in love with the sport because of this, you know what I mean? Because they relate with it. Um, all I'm saying is it's definitely something that, um, is going to be a topic and it's definitely something people are going to have opinions about. And, and there's really one group of people that, that doesn't have a choice and that's the competitors. I mean, right. it, it's happening and it's not yet. No, no, but I mean, you compete under the current rules. I mean, mm -hmm. and that's, that's what it is. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, do I think it, it has to, like, I'm not standing on a desk pound. I'm just, I'm just saying, Ain't like, either. for the first time, I'm hearing it from anglers. I'm hearing it from industry folks. I'm hearing it. I mean, we've been hearing it from spectators for a while, but we're hearing it from every circle now where people are like, this is definitely something that needs to be looked at, um, at least. But along with literally a list this long of the other things, I mean, that's what Bass's job is in the offseason season they sit down and they go over a bunch of rules and different things. And they're, you know, that, that rule book at one time probably was one page. Now it's a lot more right. rules go on top of rules and um, we'll, we'll see, you know what I mean? Like, for example, I, I don't want to get into it. No, no, I'm not doing that. I'll get in trouble. Let's move <laughs> on, on to, uh -oh. <laughs> so it was a great tournament at, um, <laughs> no, no, just some, it's risk versus reward. I mean, the amount, it is. what it I was is. about to say, isn't that much of a juicy nugget? It's not worth the, war, the reward, meaning what you guys will get from it isn't worth the risk that I'll, by throwing it out there. Um, okay. It's not, I mean, no matter what happens, totally different rule, but no matter Go sorry. ahead. I'm sorry. No, you. Hey, it's Jake. Hey, I cut Go you ahead. off. I don't usually do that. <laughs> I no matter what happens, whoever makes those decisions and whatever comes out of it, you and I are still going to be doing the same thing. I'm still going to film the tournaments, and you're still going to make the calls. You know, and and do your MC thing and and do your live uh, live stuff. So whatever it is, what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's an evolving sport, just like every sport. I mean, it continues to evolve. Baseball, they put a timer on. I mean, I think it made the game a lot more exciting to me. I, you know, I, I didn't have enough time to watch baseball before. I find myself watching more 
But then you'll meet a baseball traditionalist and they'll be like, no, that's destroyed the game. So, I mean, people have opinions, yeah. but call me a moderate. <laughs> I'm an independent voter. I'm a moderate. <laughs> Koya wins. Um, Champlain. Cody, how fin- did he finish second? Was that his official place in that third? He, third. he would have. Yeah, he was. Uh, I think he was a couple ounces off of second, but yeah, he ended up finishing third. So Koya wins that tournament. His uh, that was his fourth cut in uh, eight events and then obviously we know what happened the next event he went on it made made five i mean i just kept saying it and i believe it it was unbelievable that joey cifuentes had to wait till the final day to find out if it because curia went into that final day of competition on um thousand islands knowing that if he wins the tournament he also wins dakota lithium rookie of the year he did not win the tournament but he had another great finish um and uh, I think he took great joy in, joy in eliminating Takumi. Like, it, 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 they were playing I, I with each other on stage. And I was like, yeah. did he wave those fish in front of him? And it, it was uh I've actually cool thought about that. Coming from, you know, if isolating their Japanese background and where they come from and how they got over here to do what they're doing, there must be some sort of inner interwoven competitiveness between them just from a Japanese perspective, right? Oh yeah. I mean, you yeah. see that between guys <laughs> from the same state, you know what yeah. I mean? That, yeah. that if just, so yeah, I mean, that's natural. Um, but, uh, what a, what a, what a season he had won that event, uh, made the last three cuts in a row, obviously, um, the strongest Northern swing, and came very close to being your Dakota Lithium Rookie of the Year. But he would have had to do what Joyce Fuentes did and win two. And he did not. He won one and uh, was just competitive in most of the others. Um, so Kyoya is going to be a handful to deal with um, for quite some time. So Actually, out on Thousand about- right now, largemouth fishing with Brandon Palnick. Wh- is Literally right? what he's doing, yeah. Brandon said he wanted to go large. I'm still like, I'm sure he wants to go large mouth fishing. I mean, he's well, kind of got that other stuff dialed. Let me tell you this, my buddy, uh, and I'm going to give him a shout out. Small mouth freaks on Instagram. He's a, he's a state trooper in the state of Vermont. And he has a, he lives up, uh, closer to Lake Champlain, I believe, but he has a place at, um, at Cape, What's the Cape I'm thinking of right outside the mouth of, of Cape Vincent, Cape Vincent. And so he fishes, he fishes the lake and the mouth a lot. And he went out yesterday. He sent me pictures uh, last night. He went out largemouth fishing with his wife yesterday, caught a six and a half pounder and a whole bunch of like four and five pound largemouth. I mean, I'm like, holy crap. Like that place is freaking amazing. I want to live up there. It's pretty good. I'm, you're you're lucky. <laughs> pretty good. It's yeah. pretty good. Um, so yeah, obviously we leave Champlain, one event left. We have a six point difference in our angler of the year, and I believe a 15 point difference in our Dakota Lithium rookie of the year race. And you uh spent the whole time, all four days, with our eventual angler of the year, Stone Cold Kyle Welcher. And day number one is one of the most impressive things to me. And I repeated it several times on the stage, but at an event that it became the norm to hear the word safe. You heard people say, I just needed to catch one to get safely in the classic. I just, you know, I didn't go out to the lake because I wanted to be safe. And the one dude who was in control of his own destiny, he was the only one that had a lead and could control his own destiny, you know, because realistically, Brandon Cobb didn't have his control of his own destiny because if Kyle Welcher doesn't open up the six points, he can't catch him. And he, and he right. never did for the first three days of the event, basically. Um, but for him to literally not even question it and run out in that stuff to get it done, um, literally dude, explains the dude that he is. 53 miles from the dock. And while that may not sound like a long way to some people try doing that in, big water i'm not even going to call them eight footers because every time i say eight footers people call bs on me which i actually 
shut a bunch of people up with a photo that I took of us in the trough. Well, a big photo. You're in a trough. It could be a four footer in a trough. It looks scary. No, no not like that, bro. <laughs> mm -hmm. That was, that was, that was major. I mean, it, he, he, you know, he, I never felt at risk. I don't think he did either. I mean, he asked me one time, he goes, were you scared? And I said, no, you were driving. <laughs> and I was just, you know, I was like, I was trying to capture all this because it looks surreal. And he made that run to his, his honey hole and freaking sacked him up. I mean, every day, even, you know, we can talk about the last day when we get to that, but I mean, he freaking sacked him up and pretty much we saw Patrick Walters there for about 10 minutes one day. And then he bailed and we never saw another angler in the area. Like I never saw another angler within five or six miles of where he was in all four days. Wow. Wow. And we did see Corey, the closest people to it were Corey and Chris, and they were still five or six miles away. Wow. Well, he ran out in it and and got the job done. I mean, he won Angler of the Year in a convincing manner. You know what I mean? Doesn't matter the conditions. And 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 I was what he drove in and what a bunch of anglers that went out there drove in that day. I mean, you can get through it as long as you are slot. Like, I mean, the, I will say every day he left time to get back whenever he was in control of his time to get back. He he was very wise. You know what I mean? Like the way he managed that whole situation, because, you know, I went to the boatyard one day and I was talking to different anglers. They're like, this fell off and that fell off. And I was like, so tell me about the last hour. And they were like, well, you know, I stayed a little late in this spot and then I'm cooking back and things start to, well, yeah, because you're cooking, but like for Kyle to have the wherewithal to avoid the obvious staying safe and stay in the river. He went to where he had to try win and to put himself into potentially winning that final event to win angler of the year on day three and have a realistic shot of winning that final event as a competitor. I don't think there's anything you could. And as a fan like that, I mean, that's the dude you want to cheer for. That's the dude that, I mean, obviously I'm a big chiefs fan and dude watching that quarterback series and seeing Patrick Mahomes, Literally, I don't give a crap if my legs falling off. Wants to like go out there and compete, and that's who Kyle Welcher is, and um, exactly. a very deserving angler of the year. He, uh, you know, he gave him. He caught like twenty five pounds in forty five minutes. It, wow. We finally got like it took us fifty three miles. It took us almost two hours to get there. He catches 25 pounds and it's actually calmer. The wind was from the South that day. Mm -hmm. So once we got to his location, he told me, he said, I picked this location knowing what the wind was going to be like on day one. And so he went there and it was fairly well protected. So he was able to control his boat and he only had, he had two little lines that he was fishing. One was about 125 yards long and the other one was about a hundred yards long. And he just tracked back and forth, um, you know, using front foot facing sonar and tracking those fish down. And I mean, the way he did it. So he, and then he left, he goes, we're going to leave at X, whatever X time. And that's only going to give us at the most an hour and a half to fish. So he catches his 25 pounds in 45 minutes. He fishes a little bit longer because I think he had like a two, eight, seven in the well that he, he needed to get rid of. And he, and he had 25 pounds. So time was wow. ticking knowing we were getting ready to face some of the biggest water, you know, you'll ever face in a bass boat. And he said, I'm going to give us three hours to get back. And so he, Wise. we, he, he locked everything up. We got through it. It was, it was surreal. It was like looking, it was like watching deadliest catch or something. Yeah. I mean, it was wild. It was freaking wild. I, my camera will never do it justice. And I don't care who believes no. me. You just can't. The, the camera, wide angle cameras flatten it out. And if you zoom in, you have no perspective. You just can't do it. And so whatever, however big those waves were, those were the biggest swells I've ever been in, in a bass boat. And Kyle, Kyle, you know, there were so many, it wasn't just rollers. It was, it was a washing machine. 
and there were four footers, there were six footers, and then were then there were whatever the biggest waves were. And sometimes we he would he would try to maneuver on the crest because he had to tack back and forth. Yeah, you know it wasn't like well we're just going to shoot a straight line back to the dock. He had to get from one bank to the next, and we had to maneuver and navigate through those waves. And there would be times where the swell would come up under the boat, under the boat while we're in it, and all of a sudden. When you're trying to do one thing, you're put immediately into a completely different, you know, navigational situation that was, you know, somewhat compromising if you didn't know what you were doing. And so, and he just, you know, he just, he just sitting there and he's just stone cold, man. And he, I think Zona said it on live because I turned the camera on and I was filming part of it because I couldn't allow that to happen and not show that to the yeah. fans because knowing all the anglers were going to come in talking about how big the waves were. Well, the fans need to see that and how dramatic that really was. And I think Zona said it, he said, when we first started into those big waves, his hair was dry and it was blowing out. Like, you know, like, like the, 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 uh, like the memor was it Memorex? Remember that commercial or that, that, that ad they used to have where the, the sound of the speakers was blowing that guy's hair back sitting in a chair. Did you ever see that? Okay. Anyway, right. he, and Zona called him Tarzan because his hair was long and blowing in the wind. And literally 15 minutes later, we spear a wave and literally took a freaking tsunami over the front. The first thing I did was grab my camera bag and lift it up off the floor. I had it rolled up and sealed tight, but, you know, I just didn't want it to a, float off and get blown out of the boat because we had, I mean, we had that much water, that much water in the oh, bottom yeah. of the boat. And then his bilge pumps look like a fire hydrant. They're just blowing water out of the back. We're soaking wet. I'm, you know, you can't stay dry because the water's shoot hitting you in the face and it's going down your jacket. Yeah, it's there's not no... that Gore-Tex is, doesn't work or whatever we were wearing doesn't work. It's just getting inside your jacket and your bibs. Right. So we finally make it in. We had two two sections, uh, two openings between the big islands that we had to cross that were going to be the same same conditions. And so he stopped after the first big run back into the Canadian River. He stopped on a spot he had uh, waypointed, and I think he caught a four a four fourteen literally on the way in. He caught a 414 and which tossed that 287 or whatever it was in the well out. So all of a sudden he's got like, you know, 27 pounds now. And I'm just going, how did that even happen? You know, um, but that's also what makes him the killer that he is. Like he didn't stop he had 25 pounds in the boat. He's getting the piss knocked out of him crossing that lake. And literally, I don't care who you are. When you're out there, man, it is the you, it's like an ocean. You can't see shore. It's you an ocean. are in the middle of waves and literally you all you're surrounded by is walls of water when you're exactly. troughing. And then you get to the top and maybe you see another boat or whatever, but then you're back down into the trough. To have the mindset to be like, 25 isn't enough. I need to cull this one out of there. That's all he was thinking Pretty impressive. about. That's all he was thinking about. He's like, I got to go get rid of this two eight. <laughs> I was thinking, I was in there thinking, I really got to pee right now. <laughs> That's the, hey, that is the worst when you have a long ride like oh, you that. You got to kneel down in the back deck. That's the only way to make it happen, dude. I mean, and when you're in water like that on the way back, it's like it's inevitable that you're gonna have to use the bathroom, right? Uh huh. And and of course I had to right in the middle of all that. And I'm seriously going through what's going through my head is when are we going to get out of this? And when we do, I know he's going to run to his next spot. Is it going to be up there close to the point of that Island? Or is it going to be 15 or 20 miles from here? We'll have to hold this any longer. Thank goodness. It wasn't the, uh, dice case situation. <laughs> 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 it was just, it was just number one. But anyway, he he he's a very impressive individual. I've never covered Welcher. Um, 
before and I've always wanted to, it just never really worked out in the, you know, the draw. And I'm, I'm really, really glad I got to be in his boat and it was really fun going wire to wire with him to watch him and all the conditions that we faced and all the pressure. He had so many opportunities, angler of the year, win the tournament, big fish. What, what else was there? There was, um, Oh, the century club. He, so, yeah. so we, we need to talk about all the days. No, 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 no. I mean, I think we, yeah. you know, but we, we're covering this. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're covering. He don he had a great tournament going into the final day. He has an opportunity to win that event. Um, he gets it done on day three. He was one pound, that, one ounce behind Patrick Walters. Yeah. Tournament leader. And they're going uh, neck to neck with 27 pound bags. Right? Yeah. It was after day two that he was leading everything. That's when he was leading yeah. the tournament. He was leading angler of the year and he was leading uh Phoenix boats, big bass for that day. Right. Um, but then after day three, he was in second, was it second place? You guys went out in day three or in day four, the final day, day three, he was in first day four. Yeah. He was in second. Yeah. yeah. So how was he the, the morning of day four? I mean, he's already your angler of the year. You know, I kind of joked with him backstage and I was like, you kind of screwed up your party. I mean, normally people go to party, but you got to try focus on winning this event. Um, how was he that morning? Uh, yeah, I think he looked at it like, okay, we got one goal out of the way. Yeah which was his main goal. Now let's focus on the second goal and he could fish free freely for that goal because the angler of the year pressure was gone. Yeah. Totally gone. Right. And so I, you know, he was upbeat, his family, Justin Atkins is, uh, you know, they're good friends. Oh. He was at the dock both day three and day I get, man, I get, goosebumps thinking about these relationships and the kind of friend Justin Atkins was particularly on day four, which I know we're going to get to that whole scenario, but, um, his family was there. His beautiful wife, Hunter was there the whole time. Everyone, his mom was there, all of his buddies, like it was cool. It was cool yeah. to see that kind of support for Welcher. And, you know, he's just, like you always say, man, and I'm going to continue to repeat that. He's just stone cold, dude. He doesn't, he's just, you know, he's rigging, he's rigging his rigs, his, his drop shots, um, that morning at the boat. And he literally yeah. gets done with his last, last rod, like, like two minutes before takeoff or one minute before takeoff. And he sits down, he goes, wow, I gave myself just enough time to get all that done. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so, um, he, I think he was pretty well collected that morning yeah. and, and I hate to see what would have, what would have, could have been had what happened not happened that day. Yeah. Two things. He, um, I think when I started calling him stone cold Kyle Welcher, people were like, no, he doesn't smash beers together and jump up on the turnbuckle. I mean, yeah, I know who Stone Cold Steve Austin is, but I just meant like he is a stone cold killer. You know what I mean? Ice like the, the, he's he is the exact thing that people think of Jason Christie. That's what he is, and exactly. that's who he's been. And I think that is a great comparison. Actually, that I is think a great comparison. I think for years to come, and especially these upcoming few years, dude. Now that he, not that he lacked confidence at all, but, but when you win the classic or win angler of the year, things start to change. And I think things what you'll see him go on a tear of epic proportions, but speaking of a tear of epic proportions, and I told <laughs> Kyle this, um, funny, not funny. <laughs> no, no, no. This, this, this is about Justin Atkins. Okay. Dude. Ironically that morning I'm on a phone call. Um, and I, I mean, I quite often do this and I'm just, I'm literally rather than just sitting in a parking spot, I'm, I'm driving. Right. And I happen to pass Justin Atkins at one point, we passed each other several times in the road. And at the time, initially I didn't know what he was doing was running around trying to help you guys out. Me and you were texting oh. at one point, you actually like drive in front of me. It was the weirdest thing ever. Like me and Justin <laughs> Atkins end up pulling up to this light and then you guys go to launch the boat. 
And I'm but in dude, the boat. I'm in yeah, the you're boat. in the boat. I see the boat. Like, you're like, we're <laughs> on, on our way trailer. back to the ramp. And I'm like, just saw you at the lights. So you had passed me. And but what I, what needs to be said is Justin Atkins is a badass. Like, what a friend. Everybody deserves a friend like that for the reason being no that. No doubt. Dude, I'm in the expo with him. Like, I mean, he went back to the water several times. Once went out, told you guys back once, you know, and eventually you ended up in his boat. Correct. That's how it all ends. Yeah. Well, so we think Kyle's back on the water and all's fixed. Justin's at the at the expo. Um, and the next thing I do, I see Justin like sprinting. Like I'm talking full sprint as fast as that dude can go across the room. And he's and I'm like, what's up? Like, I thought, oh, my God. And he's like, he's down again. I'm, he's taking my boat this time or something. He yelled, but I was, but I'm like, you know, Kyle didn't even get to see that or anything. He just knows this dude came, but this dude cares about him enough that he freaking full on, like he could have just walked to his vehicle and made his way. Like he's sprinting out there because he knows every moment matters. So Kyle Watts is a great angler of the year, but Justin Atkins is a great friend and um, kudos year. to him. And it's one of the things that I don't think people get to see enough in our sport, how much people help each other and how much that brotherhood is a real exactly. thing. Exactly. I was going to say that there's, there are several, what J Justin Atkins did that day was all Justin Atkins. And he put his whole heart and soul into helping Kyle recover from what happened. And we should go back. I'm not going to get into details, but Kyle was well, having engine problems. Well, okay. okay. No, no, no. Okay. We don't need to get into details like that, but no, he was yeah. having engine problems. Fuses kept popping. Right. Like he, he went, yeah, he had an actuator, his shift actuator went out, went back to the, went back to, I mean, it happens. Right. And went back to the, uh, uh, the Service. boat yard. Right. Yeah. The boat yard and got a new actuator put in and everything was running fine. Everything was going into gear, coming out of gear. We go back put the boat back in hunter is driving the truck back in the boat in like that was what was most impressive she's like she's like this pregnant right now and she's like she's as much a part of this as anybody was justin or she was a huge part of helping when we pulled up to the dock you know he had to troll back in justin came out and and pulled us back to the dock and we got the boat on the trailer or kyle did hunter pulled out Kyle jumped in the truck, drove to the boat yard, got it fixed, dumped us back in the water, and we're off. We get about a half a mile out there this time, and we blow a fuse, right? So uh, the mechanic gave him three or four or five fuses um, to carry with him because that's what had happened before. And so he, or he told him where the spare fuses were in the fuse box on the back of the on the back of the cap. And so he puts another one in. He's like, okay, I'm just going to keep the RPMs down. Gets another mile and a half down the lake and blows another fuse. He started getting greedy because everything was running smooth. Puts another few, pull, pulls the cowling off, pulls another fuse in, puts the cowling back on, get going. We're like 15 miles down the lake and everything looks like, okay, we're, we're running 50. We're not running 70. We're running 50, but we'll get there and he'll have, you know, four hours to fish before we have to turn around and come back knowing we're going to have to run back fairly slow. So we get 15 miles down Lake and boom, another fuse blows. And that's our last, that's his last fuse. So, and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to inject one other angler who did something really, really cool too. Chris Zaldane was watching this on live because we did an interview with Davey in the mechanics yeah. boat yard. And Zaldane was watching this live and all the anglers know that the only boats that one angler can go, can use or borrow to finish a day or a tournament is another elite anglers boat. Typically one that's not in the tournament anymore that didn't make the cut. It's one of those boats that they, that they could legally use. They yeah. have to delete all the waypoints. They have to do all that stuff to clean everything up so that there's no advantage of using someone else's boat. And of course, I'm going to say this specifically because of the situation. Kyle wanted to use his Garmin LVS 34 for his front facing sonar. Justin Atkins his boat, his boat is rigged with Lowrance for sponsorship reasons. 
And so he really wanted to take his boat out there, but because it was down and we had tried three or four or five times to get it out there, Justin comes hauling ass out there in his boat. He was texting me. I know he was doing it while he was driving his boat. He was texting me, send me a waypoint. So I send Justin a waypoint to exactly where we were. Meanwhile, Kyle Welcher is on the front of the boat fishing. <laughs> He's out there fishing and he catches a two, a two eight small mouth, which is the first fish of the day and puts it in his well. All right. While we're waiting on Justin Atkins to come out there, okay. he's like, dude, what if I just ran into a bunch of five pounders right here? And I was like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. So Chris Zaldane texts me on my phone and says, tell Kyle, if he wants my boat, it's totally available. I've got Garmin on the front. If he wants to use my boat, I'll bring it out to him. So Zaldane got involved he, I told Zaldane to call me and I gave the phone to Kyle Welcher. He talked to him and said, man, Justin's already on his way out here. I'm just going to jump in this boat and we're going to go. So that's where we are before we even get out to his spot. All right. So you get in Justin's boat, get in Justin's boat. I have to, you know, I have to go through all the bells and whistles, check the live well, check the kill switch, um, make sure he deletes all the waypoints on Is that a graph. situation where you got to call Lisa and Lisa, she evolved? Like, did she walk you through like, here's involved. what you need to do? And yep. She was on okay. speakerphone with Kyle and she was telling me what, you know, make sure Jake checks this, this, and this, all what the, what they do at the dock. So we got everything cleared. I told Lisa, everything was good to go. We jumped in Justin's boat and we take off. And Kyle said, I mean, he literally is saying, come on, man, let's go win this tournament. Literally. And this is a, this is like 11 o'clock. We haven't even started fishing yet. It's 11 o'clock, almost noon, knowing we got to be back at the dock at three. And Kyle's going, come on, let's go win this tournament. We're going to go smash him. The two and a half pounder he caught, did he put it in the well? He did. So he had one fish at that point. He had one fish pounds. at that point. So we get to this, we finally get to the spot and it's like, you know, hallelujah. We're finally here. He stays calm. He's fishing and he's, he's, he's the adjustment from Garmin to Lawrence to Humminbird. There's so many different variables in there with their technologies. He's trying to literally trying to figure out how, yeah. what it looks like on the Lawrence because he's used to his Garmin. Right. So he finally starts seeing fish he had no waypoints he had no line nothing he was literally going on old school you know well this is where it looks like we're supposed to be he finally finds one of his lines boom he starts catching fish and he puts 20 pounds in his boat in no time and i'm like holy crap like what if, what if like this might actually happen here? So he goes from, and this is, we're talking about, bless you. We're talking about those now. Listening to the audio version. I just sneezed. It was very obvious in the video version. Quiet. Let's go on. In, in a matter of an hour, he puts 20 pounds in his boat. It's, you know, 1230 or one o'clock at this point. And I'm just going, this is just an unbelievable story. If he runs into two of the right fish, like he's going to make a really, really interesting end of the day when everyone else has been out there since the beginning of the morning and he's limited. He's basically got two hours to fish and he came all the way out here. He didn't go to any other spots. He went to that spot 53 miles away and used the resources that he had and caught 20 pounds. And I'll say this, we got back. We, we hauled ass going back because it was calm and he took the lake route back because it's like seven or eight miles shorter and cut the time off. And we just, we were, we were as fast as Justin Atkins Skeeter would take us. We were, we were back. We got to the castle Island in front of the dock at two fifty four two fifty four uh -huh. check-ins at three o'clock. He goes to the red buoy in front of the island in the channel there coming out of the out of Clayton. Sees a fish on that Lawrence. So drops. There's six minutes left in competition. He's already won Angler left. of the Year. 
and he knows he's he knows he's he's two pounds. He needs he needs to get rid of that two the two plus pounder that he had in his well with a four pounder because now he he already knows he's not going to win the tournament at this point. But he's like, I want that century belt. So he he finds a fish. He throws, he tosses a drop shot out there. He goes, Oh my God, this one's reacting. Boom. He sets the hook, reels it in. It's a four pounder. And he culls <laughs> with at 257, he culls a two and a half with a four pounder. And he's literally like, we don't know exactly what his weight is because this his Rapala scale is off, is mostly off, right? By somewhere between a half a pound and a pound. And so he's like, dude, I'm ounces. I'm out. I'm going to be ounces short of the century belt. And I'm going, who knows? Who knows? I'm just going to keep my finger crossed. And he ends up being what? Four Three ounces, ounces four well, ounces short. Was, well, of what did he weigh? He weighed, I think it was 99, I think 99, 99 pounds, 12, 12 ounces. Exactly. Yeah, so he was four <laughs> ounces short. And I was just like, dude. I mean, the audience, number one, the crowd in New York, not near our biggest crowd, just because that venue only allows so many people, but it, yeah. it was jammed with as many people and a incredible response of audience. So thank you all for that. You guys that was were an awesome, awesome crowd. Was but an you awesome heard crowd. an actual like, oh, like the whole audience was crushed for him because, you know, we had already hit several century belts at that point and it was just like, it everybody was, it saw was so it great I and mean, everybody wanted it for him you know what i mean like and to fall that was four one of the best weigh-ins aside from the classic weigh-ins that was one of the best weigh-ins that, that i've ever attended it was it was so everyone was so into it and i was yeah. at back at the camera trailer you know overlooking the the entire crowd and like you said they were so engaged and hell 30 percent of them were from freaking canada yeah, if not more, there was a lot of Canadians there. Um, yeah. <laughs> one of the cool moments about weighing for me, and this is just a personal thing. And I thought I was hearing it the first time it happened, but it happened again on Sunday. The crowd actually did the let's get ready to weigh him with me. Like when I did really? the, like you could hear the crowd too. And I was like, this is awesome. So, so other awesome. Crowd, all the future crowds, please do that. It makes yeah. it so cool. Um, but, um, yeah, no, it was an incredible crowd, and they reacted when he fell four ounces short, um, which was which was crushing. But I talked to him backstage for a while afterwards. We had to do Toyota Talks together and stuff, and I was like, you know, if a genie landed on your shoulder before this event and said, hey, you're going to win Angler of the Year, but you're going to narrowly miss winning this event, and you're going to be, you know, you're going to have a tremendously tough third day or fourth day with, issues that you're not in control of i said you would have took it and he's like yeah i totally would have he said so 100%. here's the cool I mean, thing sorry to during that right. conversation i said to him dude like well, what if this happened yesterday you know what i mean like just because he would oh even though goodness. he was the day two leader in the tournament if he doesn't get back on day three his weight and i haven't gone back to check this but i it would have put him in like 50th place in that tournament so he would have dropped to 50th brandon cobb would have finished where he did and he'd be your angler of the year. And the cool thing about Kyle is I'm telling him that. And I'm we're having that whole kind. Obviously, he's thought about that. And I'm like, could you imagine that? And he's like, no, I would have got back. And I'm like, no, no. What I'm saying is if it broke and there was no way to get back, you, I would have got back, he says. Yeah. And that's the, you know what I mean? Like when he, the way he doesn't take no like, for an I would have took a rope, put it in my mouth and swam that sucker back. And but he would have. <laughs> I mean, even even the smallest of details to get back, like we're 15 miles away from the dock. Justin Atkins is on his way. Kyle's got his trolling motor down on 10, going back towards the dock to make up as much ground as he could before Justin got there to save that much time. He ends up bumping into oh. some fish and catching one doing it. It's just like... The dude, he's so well collected, and I and I thought so many times about how that poker background of his has to play a role in keeping his mind in the game, so that he doesn't show emotions. So 
that's what drives him and in, into, I mean, he, he kept whittling those goals down. He won AOI. Once the tournament was out of his hands, he's going after that century belt. Any little opportunity that yeah. he has, he's going to go, he's going to go get it. And I talked to him after, you know, at the, at the dock after, after Patrick won, which I'm really happy for Patrick Walters. Love that guy. I've done some duck hunting with him consider him a friend super proud and and super happy for why him. did you mention duck hunting just because he's a that's what that's a different kind of camaraderie you know we worked yeah, together it definitely on, was <laughs> <laughs> i mean we worked together in bass fishing and then to do something with some of these guys during the off season is a different level of friendship is that not true yes yes it is okay. no, i just okay. you told me the story about the duck hunting trip Oh yeah. And it oh, involves yeah. Patrick. Oh yeah. And I can't that went over my head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. That went over my head. But I went to Kyle after it was all said and done when when we were tearing down. And I just said, Man, you gotta be happy with all the things that you overcame. And he what's the what's the payout difference between tenth place and fifth place? I don't Is know. Is that five grand? Uh I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I, I don't know. Yeah, no, let's say, and, yeah, let's, let's say. say it's five thousand dollars from a business perspective. The fact that he went all the way back out there, caught twenty pounds, upgraded, you know, upgraded with three minutes to go, and co came competed all the way to the end. I mean, he made let's call it five thousand dollars. You know, he didn't win the tournament, but he he brought and he and we got back to the dock. He said, "I just hope I didn't finish dead last. At least, you know." pull my way back back up out of the bottom of that pack and he and he ended up fifth. So yeah. goes to show you never quit, man. Never quit. Never give up. Yeah, and he and dude, I mean obviously he does this for a living, but uh, the $5,000 or whatever it was that he made more was not the motivation. I mean, he is just a can all of the greats. I mean, and I and I would say all of the greats, I know all of the greats in this sport are that way. Very very competitive. But like you, you hear stories about Michael Jordan and all these different competitors that like, it doesn't matter what it is, whether they are trying to shoot the last shot to win game seven, or they are throwing quarters against a wall. They do not like to lose. And, um, Kyle Welcher is that. And, and I think for a lot of people in the fishing world, they're just about to start to learn because you, I mean, Kyle Welcher's obviously done some stuff. Came close in the classic, you know. Has made a few classics. Now three of them. Um, but I still say he's for a lot of casual fans. This is going to be their first introduction to him, and get ready to see him a lot because he's very, very good and very driven. And you mentioned Hunter, his wife. I mean, I've told him multiple times. I'm like, you, you know. You're on board, child. Hope that they have the partner like that. Like the way Hunter supports exactly. him. I mean, I told that story about the lucky feathers he has in his boat and how she chased them down the road one day because they blew out. And it's just, I mean, dude, I hope I wish I wish for my children, I wish that they end up with a partner that chases their lucky feathers down the road. Because so that's a last, special person. The last thing Kyle Welcher lets go of at takeoff, whether he's in the front of the pack or in the back of the pack, whatever it is, the very last thing he does at takeoff is let go of her hand. Wow. They're holding hands. They're holding hands at the dock until it's time for him to drive off. And I wow. thought that was, it was amazing. Amazing. That what yeah. a great fan. His mom, all of them. They're cool, man. I'm so glad I got to ride with Kyle Welcher. And Kyle, congratulations on your Angler of the Year and everything that you've accomplished. And like I, I told you, you know, on our way back into the dock, um, you're you're you carry a big old can of whoop ass in your boat, and I know you're gonna unleash that thing many, many times to come in the future. Man. Good for you. Did he ever spaz out at all? No. Like, <laughs> because I mean, dude, you can still be stone cold and when these things keep happening on that final day. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a Not good dude. old freak out cussing. Nothing. I mean, he went out to this. He was, he was like, he was in a, he had a little bitty rotation out there. He was, he had his spot. He had another spot around the corner to the South. And then he had another spot 
to the north in front of this island that he couldn't get to the first day because it was so rough. And then he didn't need it on day two and three because he was catching big ones in his main spot. But when he needed, he said, I'm going to give myself 40 minutes to go out to that island and fish that spot. Cause he did, he lost a five and a half pounder there on day three. Like at the last minute he had a five and a half pounder on, it came up and jumped and shook the hook off. And, and so he knew there were some big ones out there and he gave him 40 minutes uh, to go back out there on the, on day four. So he runs back out there. It's dead calm. It looked like Key West, Florida out there on day on, on you know, the, in the last yeah. hour of day four. He goes back out there and he's still like not even rattled. And I said, so why save this spot for last? He goes, because it's closer to the ramp. You know, he's just always thinking, I mean, I know they all do, but you know, the really, really good ones are always thinking ahead and they're always, they've always, their, their mind never stops. It's constantly rolling out. And I really love that Jason Christie analogy, a uh, comparison that you put, cause it did, I didn't look at it that way, but I do now for sure. And you've spent a lot of time in the boat at this point now with both of them. I mean, and they, and, and I, you know, the fire that I felt from him going in these final events, very similar to the fire that, we all felt, and people, you know, in retrospect, oh, everybody felt the fire of, but Christy going into that classic, you know what I mean? When he had redemption in front of him. So I, I think that, yeah, they're very similar, but they're, you know, they they both, um, congrats to Jason Christie, won the Phoenix Boats Big Bass of the <laughs> Year. And how, Lele, I mean, were anglers, pounder. do you think, yeah, do you think anglers were pissed off to, like, everyone loves Christie. Sure. But dude, he came this close to slipping out of the classic. I believe he finished like the last spot in the classic to get into the classic. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Doesn't matter what spot you get in, you have as good a shot to win it. And Jason Christie is a very, very good shot to win this classic. So I'm sure there was some anglers that looked and they were like, yeah, uh-huh. we almost avoided him. Ounces, ounces probably away from not making the classic. And that was something that was, you know, telling and i know i don't i'm not going to bring it up again but just the fact that you look at the list of guys that didn't qualify for the classic this year it's like holy crap and and i want to say this too because it's come up several times in in private i'm looking at the official list i'm sorry he's moved up to 37 okay and polonic is 33rd yeah, the last guy in, according to the list I'm looking at, is Clark Wendlet in 40. Yeah, that's right. He said that on his post yesterday. And who's who's 41? Gerald? Oh, I just closed it, son of a... Sorry. Up. Your timing is impeccably bad. Hold on. <laughs> I'm on it. All right, so here we go. 40th is Swindle. Next, 40... Or, sorry, 40th is... You distracted Swindle, me, yeah. but no, no, it's not Swindle. Oh. Um, Clark Wendlet, Paul Mueller, Cole Sands... David Gaston and Scott Martin in 44th. So there is three more opens left and there's a chance for some of those guys, but yeah, there's definitely some names. Gerald Swindles 50th and angler of the year, Jeff Gustafson 52nd and angler of the year. Not a problem for him because he obviously won the last classic Steve Kennedy, a name that you're not used to seeing out Seth fighter, a name that you're not see- used to seeing out of the classic. Um, Lee, Lee barely made it back in too, right? Yeah. Chris Aldane out of the classic Lee yep. Lee wasn't so bad Lee was 32nd yeah so he's uh, there was he's, a time there was a time in in the event that he he clawed his way back I think it was day one he had 15 pounds yeah but that comes back and points. catches what it it wasn't as bad as it seemed it, it seems worse because we give For fantasy him. points after day one and day two and day three but those points they're not fake they're real points mm-hmm but those points aren't official until you finish in that spot. So he had right. 15 pounds on day one. I believe he was in like 90th in the tournament. So yeah, if he like finishes that. 92nd in that tournament, he does not make the Bassmaster Classic. But the next day he goes out and catches 22 and change. But, or 25, was it? Was it? 20, all, 24 and some change. Okay. Yeah. Um, and obviously doesn't finish 90th in that tournament. So the points. Right. But that's why it, 
when we do that, like the points are never official to the end of it. That's why I thought Christie was in 40th because at one point he was in 40th, but then the tournament finishes and anglers are in different, you know, angler being in between two anglers, you know, it depends on how the points shake out and everything. So, um, but yeah, no, it did look grim after day one for Lee, but they are, they, 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 the wise man once said, when things are grim, be the grim reaper reaper. That's right scratch and claw <laughs> and he did he he he's he's good at that actually yeah, yeah coming from behind he's done that a bunch of times loves it yeah. um so yeah our season's over jake that's it you were with the angle of the year got any more goodness on like w- what's something nobody saw from kyle welzer come on give us something good something Juicy. that no one saw i i he was he was more talkative and friendly with me than i thought he was going to be i thought it was going to be quiet i i didn't know kyle i really didn't i'd never even really met kyle i've run into him you know on from other boats and crisscrossing paths but i've really never truly met kyle welcher until i jumped in his boat on thursday morning and then we go through this epic ride back through the you know the the oceanic deadliest catch environment and that was i would say that was pretty bonding and um <laughs> i would say um, and so i i think you know when we came in we came to the dock on day four scott martin had just come in he was in the top 10 and he asked welcher what if he caught him you know they all hey did you catch yeah. him what, yeah. what'd you get what'd you get and instead of kyle saying dude, I had such an epic morning. If you didn't hear, you know, my boat broke down, making him excuses. He just looked at Scott Martin and goes, no, I got like 20 and just lived with it. Yeah. You know, he didn't, yeah, didn't make, make up excuses, excuse. nothing. He never did the entire time. And one of the things that I truly respect and admire about Welcher now is how hard he competes to the very end. I mean, even under the adversity and all the duress that he was going, I was probably more nervous than he was. <laughs> and I had nothing, I had nothing <laughs> but time on my hands. Right. And, you know, for him to say, when we took off in Justin Atkins's boat, you know, he's running wide open and he tucks his head and he looks at me and he goes, he's like this. He goes, come on, let's go win this thing. It's just really epitomizes Kyle Welcher and the nickname that you've coined on him and, all the success that he's had and is, is coming. So yeah. congratulations, Kyle. That was badass, dude. He is a badass. And dude, from the first time I met him and the, you know, this is, I didn't really even say it at the time. Cause you don't want to put this praise on somebody, but, I, but I mean, the more I've got to know him, the more I've seen, the more you've let us see for this past week. It still rings so true. Dude, he is like the perfect love child between the late, great Aaron Martins and Kevin Van Dam. Like, I honestly, and from the first time I talked to him, I'm like, the way this guy thinks of things outside of the box, just so different. And, and so somebody could point a finger and be like, yeah, that's too, you're too much. You, you know what I mean? Like, oh, you don't eat bread. Your mind doesn't work fast. Enough. You know what I mean? Like some of the stuff that he doesn't yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. But to him, it's just like, wow, why would you? Like, you know what I mean? That's the air inside of it. You know what I mean? And then that killer of like, we are going to win. Yes. Is the Kevin, you know what I mean? It's there. Oh. There's so oh. much of both of those guys in him. And I hear you 100% crystal clear. And if Kyle Welcher, it, let's say he cut his hair and he was just wearing a non Welcher jersey and he was standing on in the front of the boat. I'm telling you from the back deck, I've been on the boat with Kevin several times. And there's, there's a, there is a physique similarity that if you didn't know who it was, it would remind you of Kevin Van Dam. I, I say that with, I say that with, with confidence because I've been in the boat with both of them. And now that you say that, you brought light, you brought that light to me a couple times today, Dave. 
the Jason Christie comparison. And now, and I actually did think he, this guy thinks like Aaron Martins does. Yeah. And now that you say that his physique stand, he's six, three, you know, he's lean. He's, he stands straight up. He's constantly facing forward. He got bait in the water all the time. He's very efficient with everything that he does. And that's Kevin Van Dam. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, in the, you know, in his rookie season, I mean, and it's not all, it's little things you see, but in his rookie season, there was an event and I don't want to throw an angler under the bus, but there's an event we were at that an angler was making a long run. It was leading the event. And then second, third day, whatever it was that said angler said, I'm not making that long run. It's, you know, I'm, I'm staying close to home. And I was with Welcher standing there when he found out, like when somebody said, so-and-so is not running. And the look on his face, he was just like, what? Like, like it was, and it's a very similar look that you get from Aaron or Kevin, where it's just like, that doesn't even compute in my head. What do you mean? You're leading, you know, of course you're making that run. You know what I mean? Like right. he's, he's got all that. And then some, um, or coming in early or in, all those things, you know, not then, utilizing your time to the very end. And like, I've said twice now, this will be the third time the guy pulls up to that freaking red buoy with, you know, six minutes to go and catches a four pounder, you know, literally if it weighed four pounds and six ounces, he wins a century belt and he accomplishes, you know, two of the three big goals in front of him at that tournament. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. And the only thing that kept him from it, I mean, what would have happened had, had he not had adverse you know, mechanical issues. We'll never Who know. Who we'll never know. We'll, we'll never know. Similar to Aaron. Another, you know, Aaron, yeah. when he won Angler of the Year, day three went out, day four, the bolts get knocked off of his motor, shears the bolts off his motor on the way back from Erie. Chris Lane goes on to win that tournament, but Aaron believed he had the weight to win that tournament if he had not made it back. And so... I want to thank you, though, because number one, you, you got to get going because you you got to pick up kids and all sorts of stuff like that. But I want to thank you for another great season of Jake's take and uh, another great elite series season. And not like we won't have you on here a few times in the off season, but dude, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And, uh, and these are shows that I look forward to uh, every single time we get to do them. I, my only hope is next year. We don't have as many back to backs, so we don't have yeah. to double down on shows because yeah. I, I want more Jake's take in my life. Well, thank you, Dave. I, I, Obviously, you know, this all started when you and I just had phone conversations or conversations at, at restaurants or bars talking about these things. And, you know, it, it just came about serendipitously. And I, you know, I, I always look forward to getting back from events because I know Tuesday at whatever time we're going to record um, is time for Jake's take. And I've gotten a lot of uh private messages, handshakes, pats on the back at the dock because of Jake's take and how people enjoy just you and I conversing back and forth. And outside of all that, you've been a really great friend to me, Dave. And, and I really appreciate you too. You're, you're a wonderful friend and amazing at what you do. And I appreciate you, man. Thank you. You're going to make much. me, you're going to make me cry. You're going to make Good. me cry. Don't, don't, don't. I love you, man. <laughs> uh, I love you too, but we're not going, I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stick around it. I'm going to talk to our event champion, but uh, for the final Jake's take task of the 2023 Bassmaster elite series, I'd like you to introduce our next guest. I thought you were having, you're having Joey on, right? No, I'm having Patrick Walters. The guy who won oh, the, Oh, damn thought... it. You're bad at this part of the job. <laughs> Dang it. I just blew the end of the show. Go pick up your kids. Don't go anywhere. Here comes go Patrick have Walters. Have fun with Patrick. Tell him I said hi, will you? <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> I will. <laughs> the final Elite Series champion of 2023, Patrick Walters, you just got home. And I um, mean, I might as well address the, um, the obvious, the hideous, grotesque, disheveled, wet gremlin mustache that you it's gone. You're clean shaven, looking good. It's gone. It's gone. It uh, it did not last long. I got home. It served its purpose. We caught some smallmouth with it. It the smallish stash held true. Got home. 
zip that baby off. There's there's a couple different reasons I had to shave it. One of them for my wife. We're taking some photos coming up this weekend, so she wanted it gone for the photos. And uh, but it served its purpose. It did its goal. Time to time to roll to the next one. When did the smallest stash start becoming a thing? I'm going to actually have to go back and look. I've had a couple of people ask me that now. I don't know when the exact date was. I'm going to say three years ago now. Two years ago for sure. Um, I don't remember last time we were at Champlain if I had this if I had the mustache or not. It w- I'll have to go back and look at photos. But it was probably around then, two years ago, 2021, um, because I always struggled. And it was like, it's time to – we need a morale boost or something to change the energy. <laughs> and uh, honestly, straight up credit to Seth. Seth was cra- – I think it was the year he probably won ALY. Yeah. Uh, was that 2020? 2021, I think he won ALY. I and it think. was like, listen, if it's working for him, it's got to work. I mean, mine doesn't look as cool as his does, but it's like, <laughs> hey, we'll try it. And we grew it out and slowly started catching some smallmouth. Dude, you you did – that is one of the most impressive things that stands out to me. I mean, not only do you hold the all-time record for the biggest winning weight of a smallmouth bass tournament in the history of ever, which is incredible, but, dude, you went from that being the, the thing that guys like me talked about. You know what I mean? Like, Patrick's great down south, but when he comes up north, he's got to figure it out. And before you won this event, this event is just the icing on the cake. Clearly, your results show that you figured out the northern thing. How did you, first of all, how did you have the, I mean, it amazes me that we have people that compete that will spend their whole career and just be like, I need to pad myself with points and then get up north. But, I mean, how did you, number one, figure out that, like, that's not the way I want to live. I got to figure this out. And when did that transition start happening? It started happening probably two and a half years into the elite series, um, probably around 19 to 20. Um, and the reason that was, was because the first couple of years, uh, especially my first year in the elite series, um, I didn't fish many smallmouth tournaments. I never really fished a true smallmouth derby where the yeah. only prior experience I had was at Oneida in an open. I fished in the, nor- the Northern opens one year. And I mean, we caught them going down the bank, throwing a chatterbait. So it technically yeah. was it true smallmouth fishing. I was going down a grass line. And so I was like, Oh yeah, I know smallmouth fishing. That's fine. I'll just throw a chatterbait. That's not the case on great lakes and large bodies of water for smallmouth. Um, and it was three years in a row of ending the year at the St. Lawrence River at St. Lawrence River and driving home like white knuckling, never cut a check, never even had a chance, never even thought I was on the fish. Like the biggest bag I caught, I think, in three years was 17 pounds. And that was a big bag for me. And yeah. so, I mean, you'd go to the river, I'd catch 14 pounds, 12 pounds. And it was just you had that last tournament of the year. You drive home just mad, you know, 16 hours on the way home to think about it. And then you had four months at the end of each year, four to five months to think about like your mistakes kind of, cause you learn more from your failures than you do from your success. So it's, I knew I had to get better at it. Um, mainly because you always want to do the best that you possibly can. Yeah. And it was where I was completely lacking. I didn't know how to target large, small mouth. I didn't know how to break down those bodies of water. Um, and so it was, I didn't really care for it because kind of where I messed up my first year in the elite series, I was leading um, rookie of the year and angler there for a little bit but um we went up north and is where i fell off because i kind of gave up um it that sounds bad to say but it's i didn't have any experience at st Clair and other bodies of water like that so i didn't really know what i was doing so i just went largemouth fishing i did what you think would be okay like you said you would just pad yourself with points and then go up there and just try to do it and you would just get your teeth kicked in teeth kicked in and i'm like we got to do something different and so i always thought smallmouth were like oh those are just trash fish i'm gonna go up north and largemouth fish my first two times at st lawrence i would spend half my time largemouth fishing and i told myself i said you can't do that no more i started taking pride in it and it became like a passion to devote myself to smallmouth where you know when we had the off season i would do nothing but research i'd watch thousands of videos and that helps you a little bit but it still doesn't compare to time on the water. So I had those three years of like, where did I go wrong? And I'd watch all the bass live coverage, watch how the people who were catching them do it. I mean, the Johnstons are the best smallmouth anglers in the world. And I take, they're my motivation for smallmouth because 
to me, they are the best, some of the best out there. No doubt. They're going to catch them every single time. I don't care if it's St. Clair, Champlain. If there has to do with smallmouth, they know how to find them. They know how to catch them. And so I look up to those guys for that. And those are my role models for smallmouth. And it's like, how do you become as good as those guys? And so you watch their techniques, how they break bodies of water down, and you learn. Um, from my failures, it was like, we're going to get better at this. And then we slowly – it really clicked in when I went up there and fished the Bassmaster Open – I think it was in 2020, 2021 in September on the St. Lawrence River. We had to look that date up. And I went up there for a week. You know, we just had fished the St. Lawrence River. I was in chance for angler year that year. That's the year that Seth won. And um, I bombed that first day, a bunch of mistakes I made. But then the second day I rallied, caught 20 pounds. I ended up catching big fish in that tournament, had a 6.5. And I was like, okay, like I feel like I'm getting a good, a better grasp on this. And then we went up there for that open and I spent a week up there just looking at different stuff where you don't have that pressure on you of an elite series practice because the only time I had a fishing up north was in a practice tournament and when you're practicing for elite series there's so much pressure on you you're yeah. like trying to find fish you're running around you don't get to take your time and take a deep breath so when I got up there for that open it was like you could breathe you could fish around and be like why are these fish on this spot what are they doing here and so I ended up this actually where Chris Johnston also mess, messed up. I ended up catching him pretty good in that tournament. I think I had like 21 pounds the first day, caught 24 pounds the second day, was in the cut to make my first top 10 at the St. Lawrence River in that open, and Chris Johnston weighed in dead last, cracked the biggest bag in the tournament, 26 pounds, knocked me to a levit, and uh. it was like, fired me up. You know, I missed the cut. I was so close, and then it's like, I'm going to get redemption on that pond. I'm going to catch him there somehow, some way, and so – just spending the time there, learning it, and taking taking pride in it, loving what you do. It's like now, if I go above the Mason Dixon line, we don't even pack largemouth gear. I'm not even thinking about green ones. It's smallmouth only, 100%. The biggest water you can get in, the longest runs you can make. It's like I'm willing to go as far as you can go to catch smallmouth. I mean, it's you got. We all have the best equipment in the game. The boats are going to get there as long as you take your time, and it's. Don't stop moving until you find the big ones. And that's what I learned. It's don't stop on three pounders because you're wasting your time. Yeah. And I don't even know if you remember it. Me and you had a conversation one day, leaned up against a boat in Pickwick when smallmouth were your nemesis. And literally that's what we talked about, like time, because that's time. Because you go up there and you pre-fish and you're pre-fishing for an event. You need to spend weeks out there weeks. and realize, number one, how – and this sounds wrong, but how simple it is. Like, cause it's really easy to turn you, into a science project, but it can go like literally if you have the right 10 minutes and the rest of the day is crap, you can weigh 27 pounds. You're a hero. Yeah. And I remember that conversation to this day. It's like, what Patrick, you're good. You could be good at it. Just fish. It's simpler than we think. And I'd always overcomplicate it. Always. You're just trying to look you put a Southern mentality on it. Like, Oh, they're in this Creek. They're transitioning back. It's like, no, just go find them. And when you find them and they're wanting to bite, like you said, 45 minutes, your day's over, over. You've got them. So is time your biggest ally in, in this transition? Without a doubt. I mean, cause this is my fifth year on the elite series. Now we've gone to the St. Lawrence five times in a row. And so I've had six tournaments now to learn from my mistakes. And yeah. usually I don't like to be that slow of a learner, but it took me a while because it was such a learning curve for, for me because we just don't fish for smallmouth down south. I mean, we fish largemouth, spotted bass. Um, it's so different fishing those large bodies of water. But then, like you said, it's so simple. Honestly, the most thing I can compare it to down south is saltwater fishing. It truly is. I mean, yeah. it's, it is very similar to saltwater fishing. All you do is you find the bait and you find them and they're going to bite. Yeah. And it's we overthink it a lot. It's that sounds too simple, but it's once you get out there and you get familiar with it and you know what you're looking for, it, it breaks down that much quicker. Yeah. It's, and it's still just fishing. It's just intense. It it, and the North in general, I think uh, is just intensified. Everything is, we don't have as long a pre-spawn. We don't have as long a spawn. We don't have as long a post-spawn. Everything has to happen quick because the, you know, the seasons are, are much faster. I mean, hundred percent. I think that's why they bite so good is because they know yeah. falls around the corner and they also don't get fished for, for five or six months. They, they don't see that much pressure. So it's, they're going to bite when you find them. Um, certain conditions I've learned really, they don't like like a little bit of East wind. 
locks them down. Like that fourth <laughs> day, we had a little bit of northeast. It doesn't even have to be straight east. You know, wind at the east, fish bite the least. The truest statement I've ever seen for smallmouth. They are very fickle on conditions. because, And that's why I love them so much is because when they're biting, anybody can catch them. It's fun. They're biting the, anything you throw in there. They'll bite a tennis shoe if you drop it down there. Or they'll at least come look at it and probably bump it. But when they don't want to bite, you hardly can't pan them. You can't see them out there. They're hard to find. They glue to the bottom. I mean, I think they literally lay sideways on the bottom like a flounder, and you just won't even know they're there. And they just, they, they bite finicky. So it's learning those kind of conditions and that you have to adapt every single day. They're going to change. Just change with them. So weighing in the biggest weight of smallmouth bass that's ever been weighed in. I mean, that's an incredible accolade to have. But you're also the only person that has a century belt in both, I believe. Um, yeah, you're the only person that has them in both. Why do you catch what, why do you do so well in those kind of derbies? Like, I mean, the other two century belts were both from fork, obviously. Yep. Is it all a forward facing sonar thing or have you always been that bigger than I, average bite type guy? Big to tell you the truth, I mean, I do like fat bags. Everybody loves catching Who big doesn't? bags. Exactly. Everybody wants to catch the biggest bags and growing up, you know, through the college rankings and everything and through the opens, I always looked at myself as a consistent, a consistent angler. I liked the tough tournaments. The first open I ever won was at the Red River, and I averaged 10 pounds a day. Um, those are the tournaments I always thrived at, uh, was the tough ones. I didn't think I was that good at the slugfest. Um, huh. And at Fork, a couple of times, you couldn't really catch them on live because you'd catch them jerking those shallow points and stuff. And mainly, you were just bombing as far as you could get up there, and you can't really see them that well. Um, the one, the first one was at Fork when we were caught, caught him in timber, and that one was strictly forward facing sonar. The second one was mostly like jerking real shallow clay points. Yeah. But um, I really don't know why um, I've gravitated more towards like the slugfest kind of tournaments. I think it's just because I've got that mindset that if you keep moving, you're going to run into the good ones. And I don't care how big the fish is. It's just, you just got to catch one more bigger than that. You just, you got to catch the biggest fish that live in that lake. So you just keep moving, keep moving and uh, just being high strung, I suppose. And then just getting lucky and getting some big bites. Speaking of forward facing sonar, cause that's what everybody wants to speak of. What is your, your take on it? I mean, there's people all over the boards, but you're obviously somebody who has benefited from it. I mean, you're one Absolutely. of the, uh, your young age, you're still one of the forefathers. You know, you, your event at Fork was one of those aha moments in the industry where it literally changed the face of it. What What is your take on forward facing sonar in general? I'm the type of angler that I'm going to use every tool that I can to catch fish yeah. because that's how I feed my family. That's how I provide. That's how I make a living. Um, that's how I put food on the table is to catch bass. Literally, it's the only thing I do is is bass fishing, and so. If there's electronics, if there's a tool, a bait out there that helps you catch more fish, I'm going to I'm gonna invest time into it and learn how to use it and get better at it because forward-facing sonar is a tremendous tool. It's It would be like trying to build a house without a hammer. I mean, you could get it done, but it would be extremely – I mean, it would be like building a house without a nail gun. Like you had to do it with just the hammer. Yeah. Um, and so it's that's how I look at it. It's a tool. It helps you break down water more efficiently because when we have to go to a new body of water and you only have three days, you have to be better than the locals on that body of water in just three days of fishing. Yeah. You've, we've never been there. So you need to break down the depth they're in. Where's the bait at? What kind of structure are they on? And that's what forward facing sonar allows you to do. If they took it away tomorrow, I would completely you would I would adapt. I would do something different. I'd go back to my roots. People are like, oh, he only catches them for forward facing sonar. Well, you can look at the track record before we ever got it in 2020. I mean, we got to where we're at. We made the elite series yeah. without it through the open. So it's, you just have to adapt to what's out there and it is still instincts. You still have to know how to catch the fish. You have to know where to look for the fish are at. And you have to, you have to be efficient in the day. You have to be an efficient angler because time is money. I mean, you have to still catch the five biggest fish better than everybody else. And everybody on the elite series has the same exact tools as everybody else. Yeah. So just, Use them to your advantage. That's how I look at it. Do you think it is something that there's a potential that it would be made illegal in some way at some point? I don't see it. I see, um, you know, they're talking supposedly they might 
restrict the number of live sonars you might have or stuff like that. I don't see them completely banning it because Bass is some of Bass, B-A-S-S's biggest sponsors are electronic companies. I mean, if you go watch Bass Live, how many Hummingbird commercials, Johnson Outdoor commercials do you see? How many Garmin commercials do you see? And Lowrance, I mean, that's some of their biggest sponsors and revenue. So if they were like, hey, we're putting a ban on it where you can only have one live sonar transducer, and you're telling me now you're hindering that company from saying, oh, well, they can only have one on their boat. So that's now preventing all their customer base from only buying one instead of potentially buying two or three. It, I, I think there's too much money in the industry right now. I don't see it right now. Maybe in two or three years if something happens. But um, if you can't compete with using it, then all I got to say is get better at it. I mean, put some time on the water. Um, if you're stubborn enough that you don't want to get better at it, then uh, the ship's going to leave without you, hands down. I, I think we're seeing some of that though, you I know, so on too. the, on the tour, there's definitely some of that where people that were all in with it this season had great seasons. If you kind of tiptoed around it, it, you know, and used it sparingly, it, it, you might not have had a great season. There's it, times to tiptoe around it and times when you know you have to use it. Brandon Cobb is a prime example. He finished second in angler of the year, had a great year. He had a good Northern swing. Kyle Welcher had an amazing season, though. He did his job. He won angle of the year. Congrats to both of those guys. But Brandon Cobb didn't put it up, the his active target yeah. on. He runs Lawrence until after Lay Lake. Didn't run yeah. it. Didn't even have it on his boat. And so he was leading AOY. So that shows you you don't always need it. You can still catch him without it. It's all it's up here. It's still mental, still instincts. But if you're thinking about that, you're thinking, well, man, I'm not going to catch him because them boys are doing that. You're already beat. Because yeah. you're not thinking about what you need to be doing. You need to be thinking about, like, where am I going to go next? You know, what what's this weather going to do? Where are these fish at? And you're complaining about somebody catching them on a scope or something. It's This is a wormhole, and it can go on forever. Oh, but it's, yeah. The only thing is it's 100% mental, and you have to mainly – it's a battle within yourself for each angler. It's get better at it or get left. Yeah, yeah, it's – I don't know what the future of it is. It's very, it's such an interesting topic. I mean, because, because I also, I agree with you that they put an awful lot of money into the industry. They do. Um, that being said, I don't think that's, I hate if that, if that is the final decision, I hate that that's a decision because and, I mean, that's, and that's like saying it either way. Yeah. Cause if we took it to a poll in the, the, the group, bass that's what i'm saying we need to stick together no matter what all the anglers and if we yeah. come to a majority decision hey that's what the majority wants that's what if they think that's what's better for the sport as a whole then that's that's the route we go that's how i look at it i'm i'm easy going um i'm just gonna do whatever i can to to help me catch fish and so yeah. if there's a tool out there if there's a type of technology i'm gonna try to learn it because it's why would you not yeah. I, I mean, I think that the one group of people that has no decision to make is you guys. I mean, you, you're, you're competing at the top level. You need to take every advantage that's available to you and, and hundred percent have it on par. Do you think if we had, how do you think it would come out if we had a vote? Like if the anglers alone were in charge of it, if there was a vote tonight, how do you think the results 60, would 40, out? it'd be close. Oh. For or against, or it could go either way. 60 40, we would still keep it, but it would be 40%. I think it'd be right there at it. I think it would be very, I think it'd be closer than we anticipated, though. Yeah. Like, I think it would be like, wow, that many people don't want it. But I think it's such a great tool for breaking down bodies of water faster. Cause I can promise you right now, if we would not have had that at Lake Champlain or St. Lawrence, but St. Lawrence, we would never have broke 100 pounds. But at Champlain, a big bag would have been 15 pounds a day mainly because how fish how tough fishing was the fishing bite was tough you couldn't catch them jerking grass lines you couldn't catch them on top water nobody was catching them on carolina rigs um the actual fishing bite on champlain was it was just tough fishing the fish were just so suspended they were chasing bait that if you didn't have forward face zone on them you weren't going to catch them so the weights would drastically decrease we wouldn't make these fisheries look good nobody would hardly want to go to these fisheries so now these these counties are paying all this money to bass to bring us to these bodies of water and now we're not showcasing what their true potential is because when the elites show up whatever the biggest whatever the winning weight is in the club tournaments at that time that's what like 10th place might be i mean they're going to flat out catch them it's 
It's unbelievable how good the guys in the Best Master Elite Series are right now. They're the best in the world. I mean, you look at the cut weights, yeah. I don't think they've gone down one time this year. Every time they've gone up a pound. That just doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah, it's everywhere. They go up. I mean, it, it's uh... – Trust me, they, as a tournament MC, there's many times where I'm like, you know, clearly my mind is not always on my job. Um, <laughs> you don't have to hang out with me for a long time to realize I'm <laughs> all over the place. But there's a lot of times where I'm like, thank God. Like, because you, I mean, you got people. It makes your job that much them. easier. Like, 20, hey, 18 pounds. Hey, good luck tomorrow. Like, sorry about it. I mean, it's <laughs> when you catch 18 pounds and it's, that's what makes it unbelievable. When, I mean, when you're just giant bass, you know, mega bags. I mean, that's what makes television. That's what people want to see. That's what the crowds come for. I mean, look at that crowd at St. Lawrence River in Clayton, yeah. New York. It was unbelievable. They came there to see large, large smallmouth. That's what they nope. like. Well, they definitely saw it. I mean, four bags over 100 pounds and Cal Welcher just a few ounces from it. How painful was that? I mean, I mean, you want to win the tournament, but to see him have the season he had and be four ounces short of the century club true uh, I, I had no idea that he broke down until we got back to check in and i saw him at the dock and i said where were you today i said because every day he's been passing me his boat was faster than mine and so i went out boat one and we left out of there and i'm like all right he's probably gonna pass me around this corner and i'm looking back and i don't see him looking back and i don't see him and then about seven miles later here comes chris johnson he's finally gaining on me and uh, i'm like where's kyle like i never saw him and the fact this truly showed me that it was his year. When things are meant to be, it's meant to be. Kyle had a great year, and you're telling me the day after he locks up Aoy, he has he has mechanical issues. That that's I it gives me chill bumps because it's like that's when you know it's like everything held together until it was like okay, whew, you won, yeah. you got it, you did what he meant to do, and I kudos for him to stay in level headed out there and still catching twenty pounds. I can't believe, I mean, everybody else, well, you'd be, you'd be getting worried. I mean, I was fishing some stuff and I was like, this stuff's getting tough. Like they're not biting like I thought they were. And for him not to get out there till 1030 or 11 o'clock, whenever it was, and still catch 20 pounds, it, that four ounces would hurt. Yeah. Badly. Yeah. No. And, and dude, he, he. It's an incredible season. You know, it, it, the funny thing was. And we are, I already talked about it with Jake, but like his, his mindset, the whole way through it, even with all that was like, we're going to go win this tournament. Like we, we, until the very 100%. end, he was, that's you know, the mindset you keep go to win. Is that the if mindset you, shoot, you need to have to compete on the elites? hundred percent. Because if yeah. you're shooting for a check, you don't get paid. Cause if you shoot for the check range, like, okay, say we all knew that the cut was probably going to be 20 pounds a day at the St. Lawrence. And um, I had a couple places I think I could go catch 20 pounds, um, but it was max 20. I never went to them because 20 pounds doesn't – that gets you in the check, maybe. Like there's a good chance you might not even make the cut, but if you go to a place where you think you can catch 25 and up and shoot for the win, then if you catch 20 pounds, you still make the cut. Yeah. But you still have the chance at 25. Always shoot for the win. I mean, Brandon Polonix always said that. I mean, do the best that you possibly can. Aim for the win every single time, and then you'll fall where you fall. And it's usually in the check range. Well, you, you usually fall in the right range of things and have had an incredible elite series career and another great season this year. I mean, four cuts. I mean, you, you the only guy who made more cuts than you was Koya, who made five cuts. Unbelievable. He had a great year, uh, too. Oh, dude, wait till that guy Phenomenal. figures out. Like, I mean, I'm, he, I'm terrified. Like, <laughs> he is terrified. He is going to catch him. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He, I don't, I don't think he's slowing down anytime soon. What what uh, what's the plan for the rest of the year for you? Just shine the trophy, hang out with the family. We're definitely going to spend some time with the family. I actually got a birthday tomorrow, so uh, we're going to do some grilling out. We have a hurricane or tropical storm we're getting ready for. It's going to hit tomorrow and Thursday, so kind of getting geared up for that. Going to do a lot of deer hunting. Um, I still got two MPFLs left to fish. I got to go to Eufaula, Oklahoma, um, into September. So when I go there, I'm going to probably do some pre-fishing at Grand Lake. And then uh, do a bunch of deer hunting and, and relax and enjoy some time off and uh, really look forward and wait for the schedule for the Bassmaster Elite Series for 2024. And then as soon as we get that schedule, that's when the gears start turning again. It's a snowball effect of start planning for next year. That's nonstop. I mean, that's what we do is we have some off time. We enjoy it. Spend time with your family, do a little hunting and then 
get ready for next year. That's what we live for. So your birthday's the 30th? It's the 30th. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. So that's why we're having you on the show. Happy birthday. This is a great <laughs> How about today. that? Yes. Thank birthday. you. What's the greatest birthday gift you've ever got in your life? Spend time with family. Oh, that is such a that cheesy was, answer. That was, but hey. But it everybody was wants it. It's true. <laughs> it's true. To be able to come. This is actually the first birthday I've been home in probably four years now. I, we're always on the road. We're always at St. Lawrence. Last year, I was at Sandusky. So this is the first one I've been able to be home with all my family. So what is the plan? What are you doing? Or do you not know? Like, what 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 do you plan on doing? We're not doing anything big tomorrow. We're just going to probably, me and Emily and maybe, you know, the in-laws of my parents will probably just grill out grill a big piece of steak or something and then we'll probably throw a little shindig this weekend once the storm gets out of the way college football kicks off this weekend yeah that's when we'll throw down and probably stay up a little late talk to me about your parents supporting you dude like one of the coolest moments you're still up on the stage you're backstage but you're still up on the stage doing media doing the initial interview with all the bassmaster media before you've actually come down the stairs but I look over and your parents are just standing there side by side, like just looking up at you with such a proud look on their face. But dude, you got to know that what you have is different. Like they, not every pro on the elite series has parents that support them the way that you do. And it's, it's something very special and it, they should be it, commended for that. It really is. I can't, I can never thank them enough. I can never repay them enough. Trust me. I am so thankful to have them there for their support and just for them to, to be able to share those memories with me as well. Um, they travel to most, they travel to majority of all the elite series. Like dad comes to the couple of the NPFLs, but it's you, when you have somebody there that helps you out with stuff, like if I have motor issues or not even motor issues, but like if something happens, we're there to fix stuff. Um, he helps cook dinner. He, he's a great cook. Trust me, everybody who stayed with us this year was in our house. We had Shane LaHue, Brandon Cobb, Clint Davis, and Justin Hamner. And Cobb said the only reason he caught him this year was because he ate so well. So dad dad was the cook. We'd catch a bunch of walleye. He'd fry it up, fried chicken, and steak all the time. And we ate good this year. And it's just it's unbelievable to have that support there to spend those memories with him. I mean, those are the core memories that you'll remember for the rest of your life. Um, I'm very thankful to have them there and to travel with me because it, it helps triple than what people think. I mean, just for support to yeah. know that, you know, they believe in you and that they're there just to support you. It means a lot. What did they say to you when you came down the stairs? Do you remember? My, my mom was just, she was so proud. She was crying. Just give me a hug that she was just so proud of me. Dad just gave me like a hell. Yeah. We fist bumped, we hugged he, and, uh, we were just how proud of of me he was, and that's that's what means everything. That you know they they believe in you, and they that you they know that you have the potential to do it, and then it feels that much better to to perform, I guess, to actually to get the job done. You know that yeah, you, you're making them happy because they know that you can do it. Yeah, we we kind of joked. I went up to them and I said, "Oh, you got to wait for your son to finish interviews to come down here and congratulate him." And then we all kind of agreed it's way better than going to meet you in the parking lot because you're already in your truck and you, you know what I mean? You got beat. 100%. You're not the guy up on the stage. It's way better than me calling over the phone and then, you know, <laughs> saying, Hey, congratulations. But that's what means everything. It's like, they're there. Yeah. They're, it's, it helps. How bad do you want to win an angler of the year? I got, I, I just putting myself in your situation and how well you've always done in the South. And now that you're figured out the North, I mean, dude, it has to be the next check mark on your list now. It definitely is a I've got two goals, three goals really, but two goals, you know, win a Bassmaster Classic and an Angler of the Year title. That's the goals. Um, and I truly believe though, when it's your time, it's your time. Um everything's just gonna go your way, just like it did Kyle's this year. Um every the whole year will just go smoothly. And so I consistency pays the bills. That's how I look at it. I just try to be as consistent as possible. And then whatever year, if it's meant to be, it's going to be meant to be. I'm, I, I do everything in my power to catch them. And sometimes you make bad decisions. I made a couple bad decisions in a couple tournaments this year. I would love to take Santee Cooper back my home pond. I put way too much pressure on myself to perform that week. Um, yeah. I was on the fish to win. Um, I knew where the big schools were at and where the groups were to catch them. And I just put too much pressure on myself and I didn't enjoy it. I didn't have fun. Um, and so that's the biggest thing. As long as you go out there, you have fun, enjoy it. You fish clean 
and you're mentally healthy, like you know you're going to catch them, you'll do good. But it's you can't put too much pressure on yourself to perform because then you won't do it. You have to have a certain level of pressure to keep you going. But uh, that's why I've always said, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. We're just going to try to keep doing what we can to put ourselves in contention. And then when it's time, it's time. That That's why I think, and you mentioned the Johnstons already, but that's why I think in some ways they don't even, as much credit as they get, which is a ton. In some ways they don't even get enough credit when you realize, you know what I mean? Like with the exception oh, of good. Lee Livesey, who else has consistently performed in their own backyard. And that being said, Lee's one, two, and four, but he missed the top 50 the first time we went there, you know, and he'll hate me for bringing that up. But I'm just like, there has never been a St. Lawrence event that the Johnsons, one of them, isn't threatening for the title. Like it is for it, the title, not yeah. just the top 10, for the title. No. And that's what blows me away is Gerald Swindle said it backstage. It's when you go to St. Lawrence River, you're fishing for a top eight. Because there's two Johnson brothers in the top ten. That's what you're shooting for. You're shooting for the top eight, and they are, they are truly that good, on their home body of water. Excuse me, that they're always in contention. So this point in your career was five years now. Yep, this was my fifth season. Is your where's your career at? Where you but before you fished your first elite, when you knew you were going to fish the elites and it was coming up. Where's your career at in your head versus? what you had, you know, I'm sure at that point you hadn't thought in five years, I'll be here, but I mean, you have to feel like things are going incredibly well. No, I, I, to tell you the truth, I couldn't even tell you where I thought I was going to be at. I just knew that I wanted to catch them and do everything I could to catch them and then let the cards fall where they fall. I, I, you never predicted like, Hey, in five years, this is where you would be, but I have zero complaints. No regrets. Wouldn't change a thing. Um, because if you could go back and redo it again, you may never catch another check. So that's why I only look forward. It's I've been truly blessed to have a great five years on the elite series. It's hard to believe it's been five years. I feel like I've only yeah. been here two seasons. I feel like I'm still a rookie. You know, it's, I feel like I still am out there half the time, not knowing what I'm doing. You're just out there breaking it down every day, just fishing, but to be able to fish for a living um, and to provide for my family, put a home, a, a roof over our heads and dinner on the table. It's like, I'll take that every day of the week. Yeah. I mean, dude, I think you got your priorities right. And um, happy birthday. That's, a, that's, you, all, that's the I reason I wanted it. to do this show. Because I knew it was your birthday. <laughs> we don't air till Wednesday. So it'll be your birthday when this airs. And what better gift to have for your birthday than another beautiful blue trophy. And this one was an exercising of the demon that was smallmouth. Nobody will let it. I mean, the next time somebody says that stuff about you, you get to slap them right in the mouth. Like that's why this one this win means more than the first one. The first one was like, okay, you can do it. Like you can win a lead series event because you just don't know these are the best guys. So it's but the second one, it's the validation that it's like whew, you can do it. But to do it on smallmouth to see how far we've truly come, that's what means everything. Because I was so bad at it. And now it's like you love I love smallmouth fishing so much. I take pride in it. It's like we can do this. This shows you. It's like Small mouth of the deal. It really is. And then that mustache had some power. You made a promise to me on stage. Did you keep the clippings or did you just like forget about our promise? I did forget about the promise. I did just straight up. I straight up shaved it off and flushed it down the, the sink. I will grow out another one though. Nah, I'll do it with my hair molecules. No, it's not. I, I, right. I, I don't know where the hair's from now. I knew where that hair was. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to. I have to take some off my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, congratulations, happy birthday, and um, man, just keep on hammering, because that's, I mean, if there's any knock on your entire career, it is that your career's been great. You know what I mean? Like, you haven't had any, seemingly, from the outside, any ups and downs, um, but that's also because of the incredible amount of work that you put in, and you. for you to turn around the small mill thing and now hold the all-time record, um, enjoy it, dude, because you. you've work your ass off to get here it didn't come just with ease and um congrats dave i appreciate it truly it means a lot that's why when we finally when you announced 105 pounds and we held that trophy up i was like dave i just need a hug because it was like i knew <laughs> we you were like pulling three hugs it was up there and then, i know i just the I first two stop. were so I weird and awkward what, it was ricky bobby i didn't know what to do with my hands so i was like <laughs> dave i just need a hug like we did it we got the win just 
give me a hug, please. <laughs> you yes. were like, I'll give you a hug. <laughs> give me another one. <laughs> and then I said, let's have a real hug. And we hugged. Um, because, dude, I love what that's the coolest thing about my job. I, I, to me, you know, I'm just yelling stuff when you guys are holding up fish, but I love watching how somebody can come and be this unknown rookie that did some stuff in collegiate fishing, but will it pan out and watch you your evolution? The the from, lows. Yeah, but, you get but to follow from everybody from start first to day at the, at the St. John's river. You know what I mean? And you just see, Oh, he made a top 10 there. And I've watched you kind of really evolve into, I would say that you're more comfortable being yourself now than you have been through your entire career. Would you not agree with that? hundred percent because now it's, even this year, you learn every single tournament. Uh, like Santee Cooper just still sticks in my head of how much stress I put on myself. And I don't usually do that. I don't put that much stress on myself. I'm just very easy going. Uh, but I put a lot of pride in like your work that you want to catch them. So you put that yeah. kind of level of pressure. But that was a different. That was overthinking it. And so it's when you go back to having fun. And that's what I did at Champlain and St. Lawrence. I went and had fun. Had a great time. I didn't know I was going to catch that much weight. I had no idea. I mean, I thought I could catch enough to you know to try to make the cut and have a top 10 and it's like well if you catch it you have a good day it's like you'll put yourself in contention but it's like if you go out there and you have fun you're just out there laughing it's it's crazy how how much better your decisions are and how well you catch them and that's what the biggest thing is just enjoy it it's fishing that's what we're here for yeah stay it's such a hard thing to do when you're not though. Like when you it say is. it is so it's hard. going the other direction like oh just be happy have fun well that's the you know what I mean it, it's it's like pouring gas on a fire it doesn't work yeah. it does so it's it takes a while to write that chip but it's uh you just got to be optimistic you know you have to every day every night you go to bed you got to hit the refresh button and start over that's the only thing you can do is start over start fresh clear mind and attack that day it's a great way to look at the oh I got one more question I gotta ask you because I have to give you an opportunity to defend yourself because just a few weeks ago on this very show your buddy Brandon Cobb said i asked him he said he was horrible at practice he said i'm just really bad at it i never know what i'm on and i said who's good at practice and he gave a few names and one of the names he gave was you he said uh patrick is very good at practice he said he's a great practice but he's a liar <laughs> he does not tell Dang. us the truth <laughs> well i i don't know whether what i'm on because <laughs> My goals in practice is I don't stick my fish. You know, I'll catch one uh -huh. or two bites, and I'm like, you get a gut feeling. You're like, I think that's yeah. good. I think I can catch some fish here. Like the spot that I basically won the tournament on at St. Lawrence, I had four bites on them. I caught two of them. One was a five, one was a four something, and I hooked two more, and they felt big. One jumped off. It looked huge, and I was like, there's some fish there. Like, I'll go back to that. That spot feels good, but my goal is to run and cover the whole body of water. I want to see everything and I don't stick the fish. And then you make mental notes of like, this area was good. This area was good. They were kind of on this kind of structure. This is where the bait's at. And then during the tournament is when I break it down. I don't ever break it down in practice. So I don't know truly what weight. Yeah, I don't know what I can on catch. it through the event. And so like, even during the event, I was pre-fishing looking for new stuff because when you go, to, I went 138 miles the first day of practice in Ontario, the water was calm. <laughs> so you can move around. And so that's where I wanted to see what sections of the lake were good you know, where the fish were going to be at. And then you try to fish the conditions. And so it's, you try to do the, accomplish the most amount you can in practice, but you're not sticking fish. I'm not going to sit on one spot and catch five fish. I just, you don't do that. You just get a gauge on what's there. How good is it? And then in the tournament, you go there and start leaning on them and you see how good it actually is. Next thing you know, you're weighing 28 pounds. It's just how simple thought? it is. Not me. Trust me. I was like, maybe they'll all catch 25 there. <laughs> and then that day was every time you just cast a one yard, go, oh, it's a five pounder. It was like Cobb at four. Just, oh my God, five pounder. Just, just amazing. So, you, so you're saying that Cobb is actually a liar. You're not a liar. You just don't know. We just both totally. don't know what we're on. We tell okay. the truth. We just, he's the same way. He's just going to go out there and randomly figure it out that day and be like, well, I, I'm just, like at Lay Lake, he was like, well, I'm just going to go fish this one pocket. And it's like, well, I went to the next pocket and there was 20 pounds on the bed. I didn't know they would be there. And you're like, <laughs> well, that's just what Cobb does. Like he just does. That's his zone. He's going to catch him every single day. You're just like, how'd you do that? And that's how, that's what makes great fishermen is being able to just make fly decisions like that and do something completely different. 
Well, you are definitely one of those great fishermen, and it's great to have you on the Elite Series, the all-time record holder for the biggest winning margin in Elite Series history and the biggest smallmouth bass weight. Wow, what a freaking resume, dude. If I were you, I'd just walk around naked with all the belts <laughs> and have people yelling stuff behind me. That's People like me aren't mature enough to handle that kind of success. Well, thank you, Dave. It's been truly a great five years. And that's what I told Emily. I said, why can't I just win like a normal one, like for 60 pounds or something? Why does it have to be Wah. something crazy? But no complaints, <laughs> no, zero complaints whatsoever. We'll keep doing it. If that's how it's got to be done. Uh, thank you very much for your time. The one and only Patrick Walters, the final Elite Series champion of 2023. Thanks, Dave. Good stuff from Patrick Walters there. And of course, always good stuff from Jake Latondres. I thank them both for making time to make this show. I thank you guys for making time to watch this show. And as I said a little earlier, next week's guest, the reigning and defending progressive Bassmaster Angler of the Year, Stone Cold Kyle Welcher. I normally don't tell you guys who's coming up, but I think it's a big deal that he's going to be in the show, and I'd like you guys to get involved. And here's what I want to do. Um, you guys always are great in giving comments, thumbs ups, likes, all that sort of stuff, and that's what made this show as successful as it is, is you guys. And I thank you for that. But for next week's show, let me know what questions do you have for our reigning angler of the year? What things would you like to hear from him? Um, no question off the table. Um, I'll try to ask most of them. So let me know what, what questions you have. And um, by this point, if you're still here, thank you. You deserve something, but I don't have anything to give you. But thank you for sticking with me all the way through this. A long show, but a lot to cover. And I'm thankful that there's some folks that care enough about this show, this sport, to watch it all. We'll see you next week. Enjoy being. Have a great week. And as always, Bob Cobb, take it away. Thanks for watching. Please like comment and subscribe because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?